colleagues and my dear students. Good evening to all. I'm Dr. Rana Fatima, uh, practicing nephrology quite peacefully at Karim Nagar, which is a state, uh, city, two tire city in the state of Telangana. I am thankful to Dr. Manjusha for allowing me this opportunity to host today's session, which is the first academic session of the year 2023. Today's topic is intervention nephrology. When we first hear about the intervention nephrology, the topic, it arouses interest in all of us. Apart from biopsy, renal biopsy, perm, uh, this peritoneal dialysis catheter placement, the main focus of intervention nephrology is vascular access. We all understand that the training program across different institutes is not the same. So there's a learning curve for each nephrologist. Apart, after crossing that learning curve also, we have got our different sets of experiences. So today's platform will help us to understand by sharing the experiences to improve our learning curve further. So definitely this session will be useful to all young nephrologists and also not so young nephrologists. Uh, with that, I welcome Dr. Urmila Anand, who is a president of Win India, and also she's a senior consultant nephrologist at uh, Fort at Amrita Hospital, Faridabad, Dr. Milan Anandam, please, to give her presidential address. Not a presidential address, but good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm really grateful to see the Delhi doctors being so enthusiastic in being part of the first meeting. This is actually not the first meeting. We had a meeting with the Pondicherry and Tamil Nadu chapter last week on peritoneal dialysis. But it's good to see that every year as we do our um, monthly meeting, WINS has, WIN India has taken WINS and it's now spread all over, not just uh, in South, but also in North, spatially. And also it's important, thankful, I'm really thankful to Manjusha for making each and every meeting, every month interesting. And this month it's on intervention nephrology there are meetings on interventional nephrology in our country, and but as Rana said, that the training is very, very varied, and some can some get very good exposure, some don't. So today we have doctors from Delhi who will share their experience, and I'm glad my stu my colleague is also there in this meeting. So I welcome you all, and I hope you will participate in our activities, which is like this monthly meetings, our journal activities and strengthen women in nephrology India. Thank you very much and all the best for the meeting. Thank you very much, madam. Today's first topic is AV fistula creation by nephrologist, a practical guide. The chairpersons of today's session are Dr. Vinan Bhargava, is a consultant nephrologist at Sri Gangaram Hospital, Delhi, and Dr. Anuradha Raman. Welcome, madam. Good evening, madam. Good evening. She's director, good evening, madam. She's director, Department of Nephrology, Sunshine Hospital, Hyderabad. Over to chairpersons. Uh, good evening, Vinant. Can you unmute? Unmute, unmute, Vinant. Oh, sorry. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Real nice to see everybody over here. And yeah. uh, so, uh, thanks to Urmila, ma'am, for uh, you know getting this meeting all together. And uh, we can just start the session now. I think the speaker has already been introduced. Uh, or maybe... Yeah, uh, Dr. Arushi Nautihar. She is yeah. consulting nephrologist and transplant physician at the Jaipur Golden Hospital, Rohini, Delhi. And uh, she is a DNB from Medanta Gurgaon. It is really heartening to see young uh, nephrologists uh, taking so much interest in interventional nephrology. And um, uh, of late, interventional nephrologist has become a very, very important topic for the nephrologists who want to make this their career. So without wasting much time, I request Dr. Arushi to present uh, her uh, topic, which is area creation by nephrologists, a practical guide. Over to Dr. Uh, Arushi. Good evening. Uh, so I'll just start sharing my screen. And uh, I, uh, I hope it's visible. So um, 
Going forward, let we, so my topic today is Navy fistula formation by a nephrologist. Now, why should a nephrologist be involved in this? Because we are eventually the point of care physician for a CKD patient. We guide them in all aspects of their CKD management. And uh, yes, we should also talk to them about their vascular accesses. And we are the ones who will be utilizing this access in their dialysis. So we should be heavily involved in this process. And we oftentimes, maybe in centers where we don't have an access to vascular surgery to fall back on, and therefore picking up this skill is extremely important in providing uh, good care for our patients. A fistula is the preferred uh, access for a hemodialysis patient because it's associated with least infections, hospitalization, and uh, mortality compared to the other modalities such as AV grafts and central venous catheters. And therefore, majority of our patients in dialysis, prevalent <clears throat> in dialysis should be on a fistula and which one which should be created preferably 16 weeks uh, or six months, in fact, before anticipated need for dialysis to allow it to mature. The general principles and formation of a fistula that the upper limb should be used in preference to the lower limb. Uh, distal sites to be used before proximal sites because this permits a maximum use from a particular vessel, preserving proximal sites for future use, especially important in young dialysis patients. And it is also preferential to use a non-dominant arm ahead of the dominant arm, especially for those who maybe needle their own fistula at home and now that hem home hemodialysis is also coming up. And we may be talking about it soon in India as well in a big way. Now, the three requirements for a successful fistula are that there be a good arterial supply and inflow, a good vein to act as a conduit as for the fistula, and patent central veins for an outflow because the fistula does start at the heart and end at the same. So in uh, how do you evaluate a person for whom you want to make a fistula? You should know their history, their comorbid conditions, uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, uh, malignancy, previous accesses, uh, previous fistula failures, because they will determine the uh, health of the vessels involved in the fistula. And in physical examination, when we are uh, trying to see the visibility of fistula in a patient, uh, well, if you have a visible vein without tourniquet, that's the best case scenario. And an increase in diameter, if you can see on using a tourniquet after two minutes, uh, that tells you that your vein is distensible, can be used. A uh, visible vein length of at least five centimeters and an easy compressibility. Of, unfortunately, this is rather subjective, the compressibility part. It's better uh, assessed in an ultrasound. Uh, sim uh, similarly, subjective is an adequate arterial pulsatile force. But if you find a good force in that uh, pulsatility of the artery, that's an uh, important requisite. Blood pressure should be checked on both arms. A differential of more than 20 may mean that there's a proximal arterial stenosis, which you will need to tackle before we get in uh, anywhere. You should have an adequate hand circulation, especially if you're going to the distal sites, which we can check by a modified Allen's test. And uh, there should be an absence of venous collateral circulation. You should, you should check for dilated veins on the chest and the shoulder region, the upper arms, or any localized edema in those regions, because that can tell you that your central veins may not be patent. And therefore that limb may not be uh, the best limb for making a fistula. So this is a modified Allen's test, which tells us about the integrity of the uh, art of the superficial and deep palmar arches made between the radial and the ulnar artery at the wrist. So we ask the patient to elevate his uh, hand, clench the fist for 30 seconds, compress both the radial and the ulnar arteries, uh, the hand will blanch. Once you remove uh, pressure from the, uh, let's say from the ulnar artery first, the hand should uh, well, recolorize within five to 10 seconds. And if it does not do so, then maybe there is a stenosis somewhere at, um, if, if you let that be ulnar, then it's the ulnar region. So that would not be a good uh, limb to do it from. So now these are well uh, subjective and on physical examination, but if you want to properly assess your vessels, you should use an ultrasound, which thankfully nowadays is far more available and uh, in fact, its use has, sh has shown to increase the number of AV fistulas that are created for patients. And even uh, certain meta-analysis tell us that, yes, the immediate failure rate does come down when you have properly uh, assessed your vessels. Now, that's the advantage with the Doppler ultrasound. You get to see the anatomy as well as the blood supply. And it can be performed directly by the physician who will be creating the vascular access, which is the best case scenario. So you can properly assess where to go in. 
using a high frequency linear probe, you must scan the arteries from the root of the arm to the hand in the, in the direction of flow. Uh, and uh, the veins going up from the wrist to the uh, shoulder. This is a basic anatomy of the veins in the arteries in the upper limb. Uh, uh, so we we see the cephalic vein coming down, uh, sorry, coming up like this, and a uh, rather linear course, straight course, and therefore it is preferred. It's close to the radial artery at the wrist, and if we look here into the basilic vein, well, this is also very good. Uh, it's close to the brachial artery here. Unfortunately, it runs deep, uh, goes deep in the arm, and therefore is not the first preferred vein. Uh, and we should also make note of these brachial veins that accompany the brachial artery and can be misleading on an ultrasound. Uh, right, so when you look at the arteries on an ultrasound, you scan them uh, looking at the vessel wall, the vessel thickness, because arteriopathy can be common in our patients, especially the diabetic. And uh, that may interfere with the official formation as well as calcifications, which you can show, which you can see as hyperecogenic shadows and uh, you know irregular intimal uh, shadowing. Now, calcifications are not a contraindication to the creation of fistula, but they do make surgery more difficult, more likely to bleed, and interfere with dilatation of the artery post-op. That that will affect fistula maturation. You should functionally see how your vessels are. Well, do they dilate? And, in, and if when you're looking into the artery, there is a test called reactive hyperemia that you can use. Uh, telling a patient to clench his fist for two minutes. Uh, before that, uh, you can make out the usual arterial waveform, which is triphasic. But you tell the patient to clench his fist for two minutes and uh, you induce ischemia with that. And post that, uh, this form will becomes biphasic because it's now accommodating more blood flow. So yes, your artery is distensible. Similarly, uh, when we're looking into the vein, uh, you should ideally do an arterial examination first because venous will require tourniquet placement. Place very uh, low pressure, just a contact probe pressure, otherwise you'll compress your vein. Look into the vein wall, its course, its patency, its distensibility and compressibility, which is very important because there may be underlying thrombosis from repeated uh, uh, puncture of the veins. And uh, you should also try to see into the central veins. Of course, that is a limitation with Doppler. You can't do that, but you can get an indirect evidence of their uh, patency by looking into the axillary subclavian or internal jugular vein, where there's a respiration uh, or cardiac cycle variation of the flow. So with inspiration, we can see the change. And if you are have, if you suspect central venous stenosis, well, you should confirm that with angiography before proceeding to fistula. And yes, you should look for venous distensibility. The diameter of the vein can be measured uh, before and after, two minutes after a tourniquet or a inflated six sigma manometer cuff. And uh, preferably more than 50% says, well, your vein is good to go. And if you can map out any accessory veins around the site, uh, especially if they're more than 8 mm, they may interfere with the uh, flow later on. And you should know that you need to uh, like aid them during the surgery. So this is a vein before tunica and a after tunica that we can see it's distensible, so useful. Now I deliberately did not talk about vessel size there because I wanted to uh, tackle them together, artery and vein vessel size. Now previously we've come to accept the standard criteria of uh, well a good vein, one that can be used for fistula should be 2.5 mm for a graph for mm and an artery of 2 mm. But these were decided a, on basis of a single center study uh, in 1998. So, and, and beyond that, lots of studies have, uh, have been done, but no, there's no consensus still on what should be the size because you should look at the quality of your vessel. Uh, it's the sensibility, uh, the combination of your artery and vein, and, and then decide which is the best. But yes, uh, even the Kidoki guidelines have removed those criteria specifically, but they do mention if your vessel is less than 2 mm, be careful of its quality and feasibility. And with small caliber vessels, it is best to avoid those uh, areas. So here we can see the artery and uh, we can measure its diameter. And these are the uh, accompanying brachial veins. Uh, so yeah. 
And um, arteries who have significant calcifications, which is circumferential, non-compressible stenotica, perhaps not the best. And we should avoid veins which show a lot of sclerotic or phlebitic, phlebitic segments because they, they will interfere with the venous outflow tract later on for fistula. And what's the anesthesia that you can use for fistula? Thankfully, you can even use local. Uh, but uh, so the most commonly used is local, regional, via uh, brachial plexus law or general anesthesia, which is usually not done. Um, now, regional anesthesia has an advantage because there is a sympathetic nerve blockage that comes along with it, which increases venous and uh, venous diameter and arterial flow, which will help you with well, the surgery and in the early post-op period. And uh, even though local anesthesia makes it much more convenient for us, uh, but yes, arterial venous spasm is more likely to happen with that. Uh, may happen with that. Oh, and with a brachial plexus block, you may encounter well, uh, complications such as pneumothorax or local anesthetic toxicity if there's an advantant uh, vascular puncture, which thankfully the incidence comes down with the use of an ultrasound. And there have been a lot of studies here. There's still no consensus on which is the better group, uh, which is the better anesthetic technique. But uh, this uh, particular RCT, uh, uh, has looked at primary patency at three months and found it to be more for with brachial plexus block, but this is more for radiocephalic fistula. So uh, their use increases when you use a brachial, uh, brachial block, and this is how you provide it. In the supraclavicular region using an ultrasound, uh, this is a flavin artery, and this the brachial plexus looks like a grape cluster of grapes right here, and that's where it is infiltrated. Now we come to the AV fistula surgery proper. Uh, well, we have so many different types of anastomosis. So we, uh, the most common is the side to side. In fact, this was the original Brassica semino, uh, where we attach the vein side to the artery, uh, end to end, which is now rarely done. And the most common now is end to side, mostly uh, using the venous side, uh, venous end to the arterial side. Uh, nowadays, a lot of centers, uh, ours included, tends to do side to side with a distal vein ligation, which well becomes a functional end to side and and takes away the problems that come with uh, with side to side, which is mostly venous hypertension in the hand, and likelihood of steel, especially if you're using it for a brachycephalic fistula. Uh, with an end to side, it allows for greater vein mobilization, a greater vein segment to use, but they're more just an juxta anastomotic stenosis because of uh, well the curve. The curve increases the shear stress wall, which increases uh, shear stress in the wall, which increases when the flow increases in the into the vein. So more uh, stenosis, which will affect patency. And now that new endovascular percutaneous techniques are coming, then they mostly also rely on side to side, though they are in the upper arms. Now there are two more techniques here, but I think I'll just skip them for paucity of time. Uh, this is the slot uh, slot technique to deal with the torsion and juxtanastomotic uh, uh, stenosis, uh, similarly radar, which uses end artery to uh, side of the vein. Uh, it has also been useful decreasing uh, these stenosis issues. Now, coming into navy fistula in the forearm, which I'll be concentrating on, we have the cephalic veins and the uh, basilic vein and median antibiotic, which is very rarely ever used. Now, there are a lot of steps here, so I'll go to show you. Uh, so this is where we mark for the vein and the artery, which will be palpate here. And uh, well, you give an incision, but we've used local anesthesia here and uh, open it. Uh, we can do blunt dissection with your mosquito forceps and uh, uh, cautery. That's something you need to get used to with the Navy fistula. Use of cautery and miniature small uh, movements for the anastomosis. Well, then we uh, isolate the vein and we get control of the vessels using vascular slings. So uh, we color code them, you know, blue for the vein and uh, red for the artery helps uh, during the surgery. The artery, well, we palpate for it. You can use an intra-op ultrasound also if in case you have trouble. It runs deep under fascia, which must be divided. And uh, once you have the artery, again, uh, we take control of it with slings. We must free it of any of all the surrounding fascia by sharp dissection, preferably to prevent spasms. And, uh, and mobilize both a good uh, three to four centimeters of vein and artery and bring them together. And, and this should happen without any stress on either of them to allow for a good uh, uh, end result. 
Uh, Evenotomy is now performed. We, we tend to use a 26 gauge needle and uh, preferably venotomy of one centimeters with the 11 uh, uh, blade. And after that, we must hydraulically dilate the vein with heparinized line solution to prevent spasm to have it distended. So uh, uh, using the scannula, we seal the opening and uh, distend the vein. And we tend to use, uh, well, now we're gonna start the anastomosis but, uh, with 6-0 or 7-0 proline in a continuous manner. We tend to use stays on the lateral aspect of the uh, vessels, which help us in the anastomosis. Most people don't use that technique, but we tend to use it. So first we bring the edges together and uh, then we start at the posterior wall and then eventually the anterior wall. So going here in, in this direction. And once the uh, anastomosis is done, we ligate the distal vein and uh, check for the thrill. It was, it was there. And uh, here you can see that this does not dilate, but uh, the proximal portion has dilated. And I do have two videos where I can see a bit of the anastomosis uh, being performed. So this is bringing the edges together and uh, you can use small pr these probes to get into the uh, arteriotomy in the vein. Uh, now you can get control of the veins with slings and uh, even use bulldog clamps for the artery, especially. Uh, and uh, wait, something. Okay. So these are atraumatic bulldog clamps, and uh, they prevent the bleeding that we can face while anastomosing. Um, the So this is going over the uh, anterior wall. The posterior wall has been done. So the anterior wall next. Small movements, uh, small instruments. It's preferable to use the middle finger to, uh, uh, to help you with the index finger to allow for these small movements and use a probe to make sure your, uh, your sutures are coming in right. And uh, so finishing up. And uh, yeah, so now, now this is where we release the clamps. Oh, so, sorry, this is where we are uh, ligating the distal end and we release the clamps. So first the venous clamps go and then the arterial, uh, uh, you will remove the distal first because uh, well, the flow is gonna come from here. And lastly, this, and then check for the uh, thrill. And if there's any bleeding there, which you must uh, deal with, with either use of cautery or, uh, well, uh, peanuts. And then we can see for the thrill and then I'll close this off with ethylene. So uh, the two things I have not mentioned, sorry, I, that is the uh, removal of the venous branches and that should, uh, because we didn't encounter any here. So we can use, uh, uh, yeah, so we should remove, uh, ligate all venous branches that we may find, uh, especially if we've, if, we've, if we've mapped the area before and we know that they would be there to prevent runoff. And uh, in this, uh, you may have noticed, so we always lift the, the slings. They help us lift the vein off so that you will not, uh, the vessel off so from the field, so that way you will not puncture the posterior wall. and. Uh, yeah, so that is where they help and prevent the uh, flow at that same time. Now, if we talk about the brachiocephalic fistula and enterocide is preferred, uh, the venous anatomy and the cubital fossa is variable, so you should know what you want to uh, anastomose. And uh, since there can be a high uh, amount of flow rate in a, in a brachial fistula, you should be careful about high output cardiac failure and steel syndrome. And these complications are minimized by using an art, a smaller artery, one that does not exceed 75% of the diameter of your artery. So this is the, uh, well, the anatomy in the cubital fossa. We have the cephalic vein, the basilic vein, the median cubital. All three can be used. 
uh, uh, in anastomosis and uh, yeah. So I, I'll just very briefly talk about brachiobasilic fistula. This is, uh, this is the domain of the vascular surgeons because it is performed in two ways. As we know that the basilic vein uh, runs very deep in the arm. So it remains superficial for a very short time. And therefore it's done, uh, this procedure is done in two, uh, in two stages. Uh, if you can't do a brachiocephalic, then a brachiobasilic. First we create the anastomosis. And then once the fistula is matured, we transpose the brachial, uh, the vein, superficialize it, uh, going through flaps and uh, muscle uh, cuts. So unfortunately it's a large, large incision that is required and uh, this way we can use the uh, brachiobasilic with fistula. Now just troubleshooting a few things, like if you have, if you encounter spasm in the vein, which is more likely to happen in the young, prevent this with by using sharp dissection, a dilatation of the vein with heparinized solution and uh, spasm in the artery, well, you can use micro dissectors. I, I never use that, but I have used papaverine, which acts as a topical uh, 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 agent to remove vasodil uh, for vasodilatation. Uh, well, you want to prevent rotation of the vein because, uh, well, if that, if the vein, especially in an interside, if it rotates, you can have torsions here and kinking, and this is not going to work. So you may, in fact, have to do a reanastomosis. Uh, so you can prevent that by making sure that your vein doesn't turn by using either a clamp or, well, like this person has used uh, ink, of course, in a sterile manner to know where, which is your, uh, which is the upper side. Uh, you should then generally have an atraumatic suturing technique, grasp the adventitia only, fine pointed blades, uh, use very small closed forceps to keep the vascular aperture open and begin suturing at the least accessible site. In an end to side, avoid sharp turns, always inspect for kinking thereafter uh, after you've made and remove any strangulating subcutaneous tissue. Um, and shorten the length of your vein if the kinking is actually due to an excess length. And to avoid intraoperative vessel thrombosis, keep flushing your vessels with heparin isoline before clamping. So this is where we can see that uh, uh, the anastomosis is here, but the vein is kinking because of the surrounding tissue. So you must dissect and make it free of that area. So. Uh, and just briefly going over where all can you make it, snuff box, baby fistula, best use of your vessel, uh, gives you the longest segment, but runs a lot of thrombosis risk, so it's usually not the preferred one. Distal cephalic AVF site is the most common, and you can use a transverse incision if the vein and artery are close by, longitudinal incisions if they are not so close to each other. Proximal cephalic is also useful. The artery runs a little deep here, so a little more dissection required. Uh, well, you can use a basilic vein as well, uh, basilic ulnar artery. The problem comes with, well, the ulnar artery is, uh, is not very, it's rather mobile. It's difficult to puncture. And once you make the fistula, you can only puncture it while flexing the elbow. Problems with posture, and you must maintain the position with pillows or cushions while using that fistula. So it's often not the most preferred one. And a permanent vascular axis once made, well, what should it how should you be able to do it? Uh, how should you be able to use it? It should give you a minimum blood flow for at least 300 ml per minute. It should be puncturable with two needles, a good segment for puncture, preferably five to six centimeters, a subcutaneous position close to the surface possible. Uh, previously, we had less than six mm if possible, and least amount of cardiac strain. So you know that your fistula is matured uh, well, when you get a palpable thrill, you have an in, uh, increased pressure. So that's what the arterial inflow does into the vein. It increases the pressure there, you feel the thrill, and uh, these lead to a dilatation of the vein, and frequently it's elongation. Along with the vein, the artery also uh, undergoes changes. It also dilates to allow for an increased fluid. In fact, that's how a fistula should look a dilated feeding artery, a dilated vein, and one that you can use. Here we find that there's uh, kinking, perhaps in an ex excess length leading to stenosis. Here we find that there's a juxtanastomotic uh, stenosis affecting the, uh, well, the artery is not dilated well, not as a vein. Here you have a very phlebitic uh, sclerotic vein, and it, it, this is perhaps not going to be used at all. And this is very sorry, rare. Already. Sorry for the interruption, Dr. Arushi. Um, yes, ma'am. Can you, can you? 
right? It's, it's almost done, almost done. Thank you. Uh, so the early failure is more likely because of an uh, use of inappropriate vessels, lack of dilatation because of some fibrosis around uh, due to repeated puncture, thrombosis, low blood pressures, or thick sucking is that. And uh, in fact, this is what invert outward remodeling is that the in uh, Juxtanastomotic uh, stenosis tend to happen because of reduction in luminal diameter due to inter new internal hyperplasia because of the sheer stress that the vein is taking. And uh, this is mitigated because of the outward remodeling that tends to happen because of the increase in the diameter because of vasodilatation. So if you have an inward remodeling without a good outward remodeling, well, uh, you will end up with a stenotic AV fistula. And the long-term changes that may impair the function, well, of course, thrombosis, venous stenosis, uh, you may develop aneurysms, which will interfere with the use of fistula. You may have runoff through side branches that you did not see or, or ligate uh, during the surgery. A difficult puncture if your vein runs deep, uh, retrograde venous perfusion in the forearm if there's central venous stenosis. Reduce arterial perfusion in the hand, steel, and this uh, uh, infections and stenosis of the feeding artery. So all of them can be dealt with in different ways. Unfortunately, I will not be able to cover that. So uh, that will be the end of my presentation here on AV fistula by nephrologists. Thank you. Uh, so Thank I'm you, sorry. Dr. Arushi. I now hand over the mic uh, to Dr. Vinant. Yes, Dr. Arushi, this is... Uh... First of all, I should congratulate you for a very lucid presentation that you've given to us Thank you. about the practical handling and the practical aspects of how to do an AV fistula. I'll just like to put in some practical points that we've gathered from our experience over the last few years. Yes. So what we've seen is that the USD Doppler pin is used for mapping the veins to check the characteristics of the artery is a very interesting and important tool. But our experience with using the Doppler is that we've somehow converted most of our radiocephalic fistulas into brachiocephalic fistulas. Even if the patient did have the tendency to have a radiocephalic fistula, they were converted into brachiocephalic just because of the fact that we thought the veins were not adequate in size. So we learned with our uh, uh, experience and then we started migrating towards a hybrid technique between assessing the veins. We would first hydrate the patient well if the patient is, uh, if you can hydrate the patient, and we would like to keep the blood pressure medicine off maybe for about 24 hours. Yes. We would do a tourniquet test. We would use our own hands, our own eyes, try to map the veins, check for the artery, the characteristic of the artery, and then correlate it with the Doppler findings. Mm -hmm. And that was quite an important thing because we thought that we were missing out on converting our brachiocephalics into radiocephalics because we were over-interpreting the Doppler results. So that is one thing that we used. We used a hybrid of two things. Second thing that you mentioned about arterial calcification is very, very important. But our observation on arterial calcification is, if you have a calcification in the radial artery, there are only two outcomes to the fistula. One outcome is that the fistula will not function at all because you're not going to be able to differentiate the intima from the adventitia. And when you do anastomosis, you're going to have a juxta anastomotic thrombosis. But the second outcome, which, which is very interesting, is that if you have favorite. partial calcification, is that these arteries are so good, you know, yeah. so they don't go into spasm at all. So yeah. you, you get a very good fistula for a very long period of time. We, we also encountered that. Yes. That's right. And the third is about the venous thing that we were talking about. When you're checking for veins on Doppler or anything, it's very important for you to adequately hydrate the patient, make them lie down, you know, in a supine position rather than make them sit up and check for the veins because you might you might just kind of underinterpret the size of the vein. Uh, your point was very good about the distensibility. It's very important to check the distensibility of the veins and also to assess the arterial blood flow because that's what's going to cause the post anastomosis dilatation of the vein once the AV fistula has been created. Uh, mostly we're using uh, local anesthesia for all our patients with uh, either brachiocephalic fistulas or even radiocephalic fistulas. And blocks are generally given to patients who are very, very anxious or you have to convert a fistula from brachiocephalic into a brachiobasilic because of some kind of a problem when you do a fistula surgery. We use papaverine 
and we are we would also like to tell you that adrenaline itself is a is you know it releases spasm of uh, vessel so sometimes we run out of papaverine so we just put some adrenaline spread around the artery and it does sometimes just relieve the spasm of the vessels in terms of anastomosis it's very important for us to decide what kind of anastomosis the unit is going to be doing uh, the 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 findings that you showed us and the the demonstration that you gave to us was very interesting was an end to side so yeah. no, the pro, sorry an end to end side to side side to side yeah with distal ligation right so our experience has been that the end to side somehow works better than the side to side even with a ligation why because you can you can you can predict the rheology and you can also predict the angle at which you're going to do the anastomosis once you've done a venotomy and cut off the vein from the distal end so and the most important thing is when we do the anastomosis is we always try to create an apex which will be sutured first and we use a technique called as a parachute technique in which what you're basically doing is you're taking the sutures from inside out for the artery and from outside in for the vein so in that way you do not you you do not miss the intima or you do not splay the intima when you're just taking an adventitia yeah. so when you do from outside in you're basically just sometimes just hitting only the adventitia and why is important is because most of our patients are diabetics if you have a non diabetic patient no problem but with diabetic patients it's going to be a problem third is when you're doing a lay of the fistula uh, of the vein over the artery that is a venotomy when you're going to anastomose it with an arteriotomy is to use the piggy back uh, procedure you you had you just kind of skipped it <laughs> but yeah but i know it there is a shortage of time but it's very important to know that the piggy back is what we use and we tried the loop too but the loop would not function as much well as the piggy back though the angle was more acute with the piggy back but somehow the loops would not really function very well and your point about looking for accessory veins ligating them is very very essential because that's going to compromise the flow of the fistula is going to hamper the maturation time of the fistula there was one point that they talked about the arterial clamps so we we've, we've somehow not we are not somehow comfortable with using arterial clamps neither is our vascular surgery department so what we do is we try to use only the slings yeah in fact slings. that's what we also do yeah, but in so that particular one we had yeah. to use it too. right and um, about uh, the brachiobasilic fistulas uh you said there are uh, that you use two uh you know two stagings that is first stage and second stage but now there is some data which is quite convincing which says that if you do it in one go one go uh, because the problem with the second stage is that you might encounter some some cutaneous fibrosis when you're using the second stage and kind of you know uh superficializing the break, the basilic vein once yeah. it's arterialized for the torsion of vein torsion of vein generally does not occur if you have identified the apex of the fistula so once you have the apex of the fistula with the arteriotomy end and the venotomy end coinciding you generally would not encounter the torsion of the vein and the most important practical thing that we find to prevent torsion of the vein is to pre flush the vein with saline and then just leave the vein so you will see where the vein rests you know so you will get to know that when you flush the vein the vein rests in a particular angle so if that angle corresponds to the arteriotomy then you know that the vein is not going to be having a torsion there and so removing subcutaneous tissue very well said because you have to dissect around the juxta anastomotic area and you have to try to get as high up as you can into the forearm so that you can dissect the vein and keep it open so that it has more space to dilate for an uh, at an earlier period of time what we've noticed about early failures in our fistula is the fact that the most important point for that was failure to technique so if you have a failure of technique you are going to have very early failure of fistula as as short as just 30 minutes after fistula uh, creation and most of the time you are going to find a juxta anastomotic area problem so it's going to be a thrombus there and the way that you can probably tackle it is either you redo the fistula or what you can do is you can you can do a distal arteriotomy and do a clot removal so you can do a thrombectomy either you can do a thrombectomy using a dilator or you can use a fogarty 
or you could just use plain saline for doing the thrombo uh, thrombectomy. So these are the two or three things that I thought I would discuss with you. And very interesting is the radio ulnar fistula. So the radio ulnar, which runs into the basilic, is a very good fistula because I will tell you something. Most of the patients that come to us for fistula creation already have all veins fired up in, in the forearm. And the ulnar vein is never touched by any sister. Nobody touches the ulnar vein. Neither do you sample it out. Neither do you put a cannula into it. Very rare to have a cannula into it. So more or less, if you don't find a good cephalic vein, you could just dissect and find the ulnar vein and kind of just transpose the ulnar vein. Yeah. Though that's quite a job because that ulnar vein runs all the way up to your elbow. So you have to create a subcutaneous tunnel and kind of just mobilize the entire thing. But it's a, it's a pretty doable thing. And these fistulas do well too. Right. But I must congratulate you for a very good demonstration. And I think a lot of people have learned from it. And I would also like to congratulate uh, Dr. Manjusha and Smriti for uh, having uh, such a good program about practical aspects uh, because as you started the program and you said before your presentation that's a nephrologist that should create it. And this is what I learned from my, my teachers over here, Dr. Bhalla, Dr. Rana, Dr. Ashwini Gupta, that we should be creating our own fistulas and we should, we should create our own techniques in which our patients do well with the fistulas. Thank you very much. Ma'am, over Thanks. to you. Dr. Anuradha, madam. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Vinant. Um, I think uh, we are a little short of time, so uh, I hand over to Dr. Rana for uh, further proceedings. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Arushi, for that wonderful uh, um, talk. Thank you. Congratulations, Dr. Arushi. Dr. Pallavi had a doubt. She was asking whether you yourself do brachial plexus block. Uh, no, we do not. Uh, our anesthesia team does. And uh, we don't use it all that commonly, but uh, yes, we uh, in a fair percentage, but uh, our anesthesia team does. We okay. Do Thank you, Dr. Arushi. The second topic uh, today is femoral and IGV pemcath insertion by nephrologist in resource limited settings. The chairpersons of this session are Dr. Muthu Jairaman, senior consultant nephrologist, Curie Hospital, Chennai. Welcome, madam. Dr. Kunal Gandhi, Consultant Nephrology, Amrita Hospital, Faridabad, and Dr. Sayali Thakre, Assistant Professor Nephrology, KMH, Mumbai. Over to Jay Persons. Um, oh, hello and welcome everyone. Uh, yes, madam. Madam, please go ahead. Oh, uh, thank you for asking me to chat this session. It's a wonderful session particularly by women uh, nephrologists doing so beautifully, the interventional uh, vascular access. Now, uh, the speaker today is, uh, the name is Dr. Smriti Sinha, a consultant nephrologist and transplant physician from NUH, which, which ex-assistant professor, uh, in uh, Mumbai. And where, where is she now at present? Ma'am, I'm at uh, Maringo QRG Hospital in Faridabad, ma'am. Oh. So she's going to talk about perm cath and uh, procedure. Uh, welcome, Dr. Smriti Sina. Uh, you go you. ahead with the talk. I'll start my screen share. Good evening, everyone. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Good evening. Uh, so I start my talk. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk on uh, perm cats. Uh, just uh, before we get into this talk, there is a terminology that I would like to clear. We keep uh, so perm cat is basically a brand name of a chronic dialysis cuffed catheter, which we used to use before. It was uh, made and marketed by uh, Covidin. And we do not use this catheter as much anymore in any of the setups. So for the sake of the talk, I'll be using the word TCC, which is basically your tunneled cuffed catheters. These are your chronic uh, catheters, different studies, different papers, different people uh, basically use a combination of chronic cuffed catheters or chronic uh, central venous catheters, but they're all interchangeable. 
Uh, so like my colleague, Dr. Arushi has already highlighted, uh, CKD patient's survival depends on proper functioning of his vascular axis. And yet this remains an Achilles heel for most of our patients. And unfortunately, because of all the problems they face, the uh, vascular axis receives the least amount of attention. Uh, generally, the care is fragmented between nephrologists, radiologists, surgeons, and this leads to a lot of shuffling between the different brand, uh, departments. Poor coordinations can lead to misdialysis, patient frustration, uh, increased morbidity, as well as cost of care. So as nephrologists, we are best suited to make decisions regarding dialysis initiation as well as vascular access. Uh, fistula, of course, is the best that we can do for our patients. And fistula first teaches us to actually start talking about and planning an AV fistula when the GFR drops less than 20. But the sad reality in India especially is that most of our patients crash line to us or are diagnosed in uh, CKD stage 5. And if we mention the D word to them, that is dialysis, a lot of them will just not accept it. In fact, most of them will go to alternative medicines or try something else. Uh, this is a study which was published in uh, JAMA. This is a little old, the data, but it basically shows that even with fistula first and all the uh, medical care being taken care of in developed countries like USA, a uh, dismal number of patients actually started their dialysis with fistula. It was only about 12 to 15% patient, patients, uh, CKD patients who started their dialysis with a fistula. Most of the patients were still initiated via a uh, catheter. And what is the Indian scenario? This was a study which was uh, presented in Aftar in 2016 by Dr. Raja Ramchandran. And this basically talks about the different developed and developing countries in Southeast Asia. And what we see is that most of the incident dialysis take place with the help of an acute dialysis catheter, 70% in our country, uh, and with maybe a TCC more in your uh, comparatively more developed South Asian countries like Singapore or Brunei or Thailand. Sorry, not Thailand as much, but yes. Uh, AV fistula still is very less at about 10%, which is similar to the uh, JAMA study. Even in our patients, hardly 10% have a functioning fistula at the time that they need a dialysis. Coming to different aspects of interventional nephrology, most of us are trained in acute dialysis catheters as well as biopsies, but TCC is something that is your tunnel cuff uh, perm cats is uh, something which only about 67% people uh, know or practice. And what are the common reasons cited? Time constraint, lack of formal training, which is an astounding 73%, medical legal fear, 47%, and a lack of resources and backup support. Despite this being said, uh, when asked if what was the resources available in their setup, focus, which is your point of care ultrasound, was available at all the centers, and fluoroscopy was present in at least half the centers. So uh, what are the situations in which you should or may prefer to use a perm cath or a tunnel catheter? In very small children, in diabetic patients who have severe vascular disease, like uh, Dr. Arushi already covered, uh, in morbidly obese patients, patients who have already had multiple AV accesses and they have failed, uh, severe cardiomyopathy, wherein uh, a high flow fistula might lead to decompensation and hence uh, not preferred. Patients who are on nocturnal dialysis or very frequent dialysis might not want to get pricked very frequently and prefer a pump cat. Patients with a short lifespan and elderly patients, Patients who have an AV access, which is maybe ready in the near future, and patients who are transplant candidates can go on a perm cath. So coming to your right IGV perm cath insertion, uh, what I would like to say is that perm cath insertions or your tunnel cuff catheters have almost 80% commonality with your acute catheter insertion. So there are just a few additional steps that need to be learned and very easily can we learn how to do this uh, catheter insertion after that. The different sites that we can use are similar to the acute catheters, most commonly the internal jug jugular vein, left as well as right. Apart from these other veins include your subclavian, your external jugular vein, which basically drains into your subclavian, or any literally any collateral which drains into your subclavian and then into the brachiocephalic and SVC can be used for a catheter insertion. So 
in a Bonkat insertion, what we do is we take a very low puncture, very, as close as possible to the clavicle. So it is better that we do an ultrasound guided puncture because that increases your chances of complication. This is a typical Doppler image that you would see wherein the right IJV is superior and lateral to your carotid. And uh, coming to the steps of TCC insertion. So TCC insertions generally are done either in cath labs, OT, but you can have a simple procedure room set aside where we have at least an ultrasound available, a cardiac monitor, and basic equipments for cleaning and suturing and uh, dissection, then even those rooms can be prepared into procedure rooms and can be used as a TCC insertion places. So you paint and drape the individual, you give the local anesthesia, and then you take an ultrasound guided puncture as low as possible and as close to the clavicle as possible. After that, the initial few steps is very similar to your uh, temporary catheter insertion. That is, you put in the guide wire and you confirm the position of the guide wire. If you have a fluoroscope available, you can do that. Uh, a fluoroscope based position can be confirmed. What I'm using here is a curved catheter and Oh, sorry, I'm just going to go back a little. Uh, what I do is also use surface marking. So if you have straight catheters, the sec, uh, sorry, your angle of Louis can be used as the reference point uh, where you can put the tip of the catheter and use that as the reference point and then make a curve, which is slightly more obtuse so that there will be no kinking. And you make your surface markings around the point, around your, sorry, tunnel area with the back of uh, a needle or the hub of a needle. After making those surface markings, you can go ahead and give your local anesthesia. This local anesthetic also acts as a dissector. So you have to go into the subcutaneous plane and uh, put in the local anesthesia. Be generous with this because this is one of the most painful uh, parts for the patient when you dissect through the subcute tissue. You can use a longer needle, even a lumbar puncture needles can be used. The fascia is toughest around the clavicle, so you can put a lot uh, more of your anesthesia over there. That will help with your dissection later on also. After putting the local anesthetics, you make a small incision. So you will see the fascia, you go below the fascia into the subcute plane and you dissect as much as possible. I also take a small nick at the insertion site where the guide wire is present and dissect a little there, not too much. If a previous catheter has been inserted, maybe you need to dissect more because of fibrosis. Then you put in the, uh, sorry, the perm cat is loaded onto this uh, sheath, sorry, uh, onto the metal and pulled out through the upper incision point. The rest steps are similar. You just uh, dilate at, there are two dilators, eight French and 10 French. And after this, this is the sheath, which is on uh, another dilator, which is then slowly put into the upper, uh, over the guide wire. I take it slowly. You should always do it slowly because uh, this can lead to shearing and tear of your veins if you go too rapid with it. It's a big dilator in it and you pull it out. There is a valve actually present on this sheet, which prevents your blood from gushing out. Take the catheter, put it inside the sheet, put it as in as possible. And then with a the click movement, you tear the sheet, hold down the catheter with your thumb and pull out the sheet from your with your other two hands, keeping the pressure on the catheter with your thumb the whole time. You can ask another person to help you if it's a little difficult initially. So this is the entire procedure. After this, we generally confirm the position of the catheter using a fluoroscope if you don't have that. For example, when I was at Nair and we didn't have an active fluoroscope, we used to send the patient down to this x-ray, get an x-ray done. And then if we find the position to be a little too in or too out, we would adjust it immediately. Uh, this is how the curve and the tip should be. The tip, ideal place for the tip should be in the right atrium. 
and uh, the curve should be smooth. There should be no kinking present here. One thing to remember is, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. One thing to remember in this is uh, that we will have to, uh, I'm so sorry, I'll just have to take two minutes. Sorry. Uh, one thing to remember is that uh, we have to make sure that the tunneling has not happened into the breast tissue or any heavy tissue because when the patient gets up, there might be some tugging at the catheter and that will lead to the catheter being pulled out. So if your right IGV is thrombosed, what do you do next? Whereas do you uh, do this. The other place is uh, left IJ, external jugular vein, femoral catheters, subclavian veins, and other atypical sites that I use is your translumbar and transhepatic. I'm sorry, the screen's not moving. Yeah. So generally, the school of thought is that after the right IGV, we go for the left IGV. But uh, I recently gone for a workshop in Singapore where they had a very interesting approach called the right neck first. Their belief was that uh, their belief was that uh, if you are using uh, puncturing the brachiocephalic of one side, then that's where the stenosis can occur in the future also. And hence, we have to continue using that same side. So they would do the right IJV, a right EJV, a right supraclavicular, uh, subclavian, or any collateral that they could find. Uh, the other, this is a right EJV catheter, which pretty much looks similar to an IJ, where it goes uh, there is a high risk of kinking with EJVs because it's a very superficial catheter, a superficial vein, and while puncturing it, uh, sometimes you can have very acute angles with the tunnel, and that can lead to kinking. These are some left catheters. The thing with left catheters is that we generally need a fluoroscope to do this. Uh, if we don't have fluoroscope available in resource limited settings, we have done sheathless insertions, which can be done with newer uh, catheters like your glide path, or with, in fact, very old catheters, which were stiffer, like first generation uh, tip, stagger tip catheters, which are stiffer, so they can be used for a sheathless insertion. Now, coming to femoral TCC, uh, the ideal position for that is uh, your IVC. Some people also use much longer catheters of 55 centimeter, which goes all the way to your right atrium. This is a case that I recently had where this is, this is very common for most of us. We have a 52 year old male. He was diabetic, hypertensive, coronary artery disease with a triple vessel disease. He came with acute on CKD about a year ago where he had to be dialyzed via right IJV. He developed line sepsis during that episode, but he recovered and he was actually had a decent urine output. So we put him off hemodialysis for a month on medical management, but he was restarted on dialysis one month later because he came with fluid overload. But this time when we tried to put in a catheter, the right IJV was thrombosed. The left IJV was catheterized. He was advised for maintenance hemodialysis, but he left us and he went off on alternative medicines for two months. Uh, he came back to us. We continued dialysis, made his right AV fistula, but with three months of use, uh, it was hardly used for three months because he got thrombosed while he had an episode of hypertension during dialysis. His right hand veins were not feasible for AV fistula creation. So we took him up for a perm cat insertion. His right IJV, his left IJV, and his right EJV, all three were thrombosed. So we had no option and we put in a left femoral perm catheter. Planned for a left BC BCAV fistula, he didn't get it done. And then six months later, he came to us with catheter insertion infection again. So this catheter had to be removed. So uh, this time we took him into OT. This was the ultrasound. And as you can see, the right IJV is fully thrombosed. The left IJ was small. There was hardly any flow on the Doppler. But so we thought we'll try and cannulate it. But when we tried to cannulate it, uh, the guide wire could not be negotiated. So we made an on-table decision of putting a right, sorry, uh, yeah, a right femoral uh, TCC for him. 
at that point of time, there was huge shortages of TCC going on. So the only one that was available with us was a 24 centimeter one, even though a 35 centimeter or plus is what is ideal for us. Uh, uh, we went ahead with the catheter and ultrasound guided guide wire was inserted. This is the surface marking of the same. This is the head end and the foot end. And what you can see is, I'm so sorry, there's some disturbance. Sorry. So uh, what you can say, this is the head end, this is the foot end, and this is the inguinal ligament. Uh, we use umbilicus as the surface marking. And again, the this is how the catheter was placed and the position for the tunnel was created. Then, sorry, similar to what we have done with the right IJ, perm cath, we put the anesthetist, anesthesia, sorry, along the catheter hubs that marks that you can see here. I went slightly lateral to it and I gave the anesthesia. We then went ahead and dilated the two sides, the lower end as well as the upper end, went to the subcutaneous plane of it and dissected as much as possible. Sorry. I'm sorry. The video is not playing. Oh, sorry. Oh, my video is hanging for some reason. I'm sorry. Siddharth, are you there? Can you please help Siddharth? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, ma I have to reshare uh, the slide. Uh, I'll just, I'll just start it. I'm sorry. I'll just, can I uh, reshare? Yeah. Share screen. Yeah, sorry. Is it available? Uh... Yeah, visible, Smithy. Put in slideshow. Yeah. Show. yeah. Huh. So. Yeah. So basically, after dilating the top and the bottom end, the subcutaneous plane. We take the catheter, which has been mounted onto the metal rod, and we pull it out from the other end. At this step, you have to be careful because a lot of time during this tugging, the wire gets kinked. So we have to be very careful that the wire doesn't get kinked because that will make the dilatation process very difficult later on. You can put the catheter to lateral of the guide wire and then you dilate it like you would dilate your acute catheters. There's an eight French and then a 10 to 12 French dilator. And then you take the sheath which has been mounted on another dilator and you load it on and you push it in. You have to go a little slow, keep checking your guide wire to see that there is no kinking that has happened. So you know you'll be in the right plane in that case. And then you pull out the guide wire along with the inside dilator and keep the sheet in. After this, you take the catheter, you put it inside. So this is a pre-curve catheter which I'm using. And because of the pre-curve, uh, it was a little difficult to push the entire catheter in. I had to adjust it later on, which you will see at the end of the video. But uh, once it goes in, you hold it in with your thumb and you peel off the sheath. You can ask someone else 
I'm sorry. So you see that because of the curve, it's becoming a little difficult to push it in. There's a rebound which comes out, which I will adjust at the end. And the video is again stopping. I'm so sorry. I don't know why this is happening. This was the last video. Siddhar? I'll have to reshare it, I think. That is a yes. 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 Sorry. Is it visible? Not at Shruti. Yeah, sorry. Just a minute. Mm -hmm. Select over. Share. I don't know where. Yeah. Now is it visible? See, yeah, put in slideshow. Yeah. yeah. So uh, after this, Basically, the catheter, uh, the same steps were repeated. The sheath was pulled out and the blood flow was checked. And like you can see, there's free flow of blood. This was the final position. This is the head end and the foot end. And what you can see is basically the catheter comes out on the lateral wall. So it is a little modest. People can wear their, uh, females can wear their petticoats and pants. And this catheter side basically comes out above and lateral to it. So it is easy to access also. This is what a typical 35 centimeter catheter would look like after insertion. It goes into your IVC and the uh, AP as well as if you take the lateral x-ray, this is where you can see the tip. The other uh, way of tunneling is if you don't want to, if it's a very obese patient specifically and you have a lot of skin fold, taking it up might be a little difficult. So you can tunnel it and you can take out the tunnel at the end on your thigh, like mid thigh can be the end of the tunnel. Uh, there was a patient who we had recently gotten and a 55 centimeter femoral catheter had been inserted for her by a vascular surgeon. But uh, this patient actually, when we took her x-ray, if you can see the tip is curving inside the right atrium. 55 centimeter catheters, catheters are very long, especially for a shorter Indian patient. She was a short five, I think four feet eight Indian patient, uh, female. And when we did an eco, this tip was actually in the right ventricle. So this is something that we need to be careful about with very long catheters. Uh, this was a study which basically, uh, if the right IJV is thrombosed, all of us go for the left jugular axis, as the traditional teaching is that femoral axis can have higher infections. But this was a study by uh, in which they showed that femoral as well as IJV catheters have similar rates of infection, except in the subset of obese patients where femoral catheters have higher rates of infection. So since femoral catheters are some uh, femoral cannulation is something that all of us is have been doing, uh, especially for our temporary catheters. And in resource limited settings, this can be a lifesaver sometimes. These are the different tips of catheters, a step tip, a hemosplit, and a palindrome. What you saw in the video was a hemosplit. What are the differences in performances? Hemosplit versus staggered tips. Hemosplit is uh, said to have lower circulation rates and longer lengths. Palindromes have better flow rates and just overall lesser catheter dysfunction, but more or less, there is no major difference between any of the catheters. So take home message would be that nephrologists should be involved with vascular access planning. Your perm cat insertions, basic AV fistula creations can be learned by us. It is a skill. We do more, we learn more. The common uh, argument that I keep getting from a lot of people is that a temporary catheter is practiced more at our centers because it is much cheaper. But like we spoke about how if we are shuffling the patient between different departments, trying to get them dates for AV fistulas, uh, then the average scenario is that it takes about two to three months before a functional fistula or a transplant is done. And if you do the cost analysis of a patient on a temporary catheter for these three months, 
uh, it is not only equal, if not more expensive, but it also mainly leads to loss of your precious central veins, which can be, create a problem later on when we want to create fistulas or if there's a clear transplant and they come back on dialysis. Hence, preserving central veins are very important. And I think a TCC does a better job at it than a temporary catheter. And yes, that would be my final slide. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smithy. Excellent talk. Um, but for the di little disruption, your show is wonderful. So I want to know a few things. <clears throat> Do you, you said the femoral catheter and uh, uh, jugular catheter, uh, same uh, duration without infection. Is it possible in our group of people to have that kind of, I mean, femoral catheters are known for infection and how do they protect uh, from infection in the site, anti site? Uh, Ma'am, are you asking if they have the same rate of infection as compared yeah. to an HIV? Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, uh, practically speaking, uh, I must have an experience of about 20, 25 femoral catheters uh, that mm -hmm. I have inserted personally and uh, have at my center. And infection is something which is equally common in both. However, in patients who are bed bound, who have chronic diarrhea or are on diaper and all, which mm -hmm. might be a case for patients who have had multiple AV uh, vascular failure or elderly patients. In those cases, of course, chances of infection with the femoral catheter is more, I think because of the general hygiene and uh, being in a bed bound state. But otherwise, if well-maintained, uh, we've had patients for even up to two years. That's the longest patient I've had on a femoral perm cat. What is the longevity of your femoral catheter? How long do you keep them? Ma'am, <laughs> depends on the indication. Like in this patient, uh, we have planned a uh, AV fistula, so it will be removed after that. But otherwise, the range is from six months to even two years. Like I said, the longest that we have seen is two years with a femoral perm cat. We use a cap for the uh, perm cat called Q site. Huh, yes. No, ma'am, we different. haven't used that. Do you use yeah. that? No, uh, ma'am, not at our center. Uh, uh, but yes, some but people do use that. That brings down the infection rate because we, we have patients even for three years without uh, much infection and uh, with the temporary catheter, uh, this perm cat. So, do you use that? Uh, no, ma'am, not at our center. We haven't used, but that's a good point, ma'am. Maybe we should look into it. Can you convert, uh, so you put an IJB uh, temporary catheter, can you convert it into perm cat through the same line? Yes, ma'am. Ma uh, yes, ma'am. Depends on the site of insertion, actually. If it is a very high up puncture, then we try to avoid it because then that increases your chances of kinking. But if it is a mid to low puncture, then yes, ma'am, we have converted. Uh, IJs into perm cats. Oh, request other chat persons to. Hi, good evening, Smriti. Dr. Kunal here. Good evening, sir. Yeah. Achha, <clears throat> between that patient where uh, you, know, you had inserted the femoral catheter, you showed that there is a small, I think uh, the IJ was a little small. You know, the caliber was quite small. So are you, uh, did you <clears throat> a stiff wire or are you using a termo, you know, a more flexible wire? Are you, you, know, you in such patients where no, you are not able to pass a, a normal guide wire. Uh, sir, because he had history of previous uh, catheterizations in the past, and his, in fact, just six months ago, his left IJ was fully thrombus. If this time he, there was some recanalization, we had thought that we will try. And, we were suspecting that maybe there might be stenosis down below also, which we can't see as such on just an ultrasound. So we uh, we didn't use a termo wire in this case. We used the one which came with the set, and uh, right after insertion, within a few centimeters, we couldn't negotiate it. So uh, no, but in other cases, yes, uh, we have used termo wires just to see how easily we can uh, use it. Like I mean, we can put it in. I, uh, regarding your point, no, regarding no, you said that especially in females where. You should avoid a lateral entry. No, in, in our personal experience, what we were doing previously, I think Dr. Pallavi also will agree that no, we created a midline exit site. So most no, of our patients yeah. no, created a midline. So there is no movement. No, this is especially important when you are putting left side. No, initially, when the fibrosis is not there with the movement and all, the catheter comes out. 
you know, and sometimes the flows are not good, and this is more common on the left side. So you now we have you know, very good results with the midline. So even for a curved catheter, we can create a midline that is more suitable because the natural curve is like that. You no, know? so if you place in that, so the the uh, the exit side comes in the midline. Even for our straight palindrome catheters, we were using a midline uh, exit side, and the results were quite good. You know? Even even for males as well as females, you know you don't have to undress fully to expose the ports and all. So I think we we ready and we are continuing the same thing right now. Yes, sir. Actually, we also do that. Uh, it's a very, very valid point, sir. especially uh, for females. We try and take uh, with curved catheters, it's much easier to take a midline uh, tunnel. Dr. Smithy, that was a wonderful presentation. Uh, there is a query in the chat box. Uh, what about this below groin approach for tuft femoral catheter? And one more question I have is, you said instead of exploring the right side again and again, can we go straight away for this uh, femoral cuff catheter rather than exploring the same side, as you said, you've got trained in Singapore. So we, that will lead the upper limb vessels from a heal, healing and also for the thrombus to resolve it is there. Of, of course. Uh, so what they did in Singapore was actually that they used the right side again and again, even if there was a partial thrombus or if uh, even if the right IJ was fully thrombosed and they could see uh, collaterals draining into where they could, you know, trace it with the help of a Doppler or a fluoroscope uh, by with using a dive, they could see that it's going into a subclavian and a patent brachiocephalic. Then they would use the collaterals. They believed that using the same set of veins draining into the same brachiocephalic is much better because it saves the other uh, vessels from any kind of puncture and any kind of uh, loss uh, or, you know, like stenosis or thrombosis. Because even all these thrombosis, most of them do heal with some amount of fibrosis. But uh, that being said, yes, if you are planning a fistula for someone and you feel like... Uh, you, you know, like instead of puncturing the same side, like for example, you're making the right uh, BC fistula and you don't want to uh, use the upper side veins, yes, you can go for a femoral because it will also be short term in that case. So, yes. Dr. Sally Chakri, your comments, please. Yeah. So, excellent demonstration, uh, Dr. Smriti. Uh, I especially want to underline your point of uh, fragmentation of care that happens uh, when uh, a fistula or a tunnel catheter is planned. And this does, doesn't happen just at the beginning when the patient needs his first AV fistula or the first tunnel catheter. It keeps happening. And especially at the stage when the patient reaches multi-axis failure, we again need to be involved uh, in order to decide which veins or which uh, fistula and what order uh, the fistula and the vein uh, and or the, uh, the uh, tunnel catheter must follow and which site needs to be chosen. So a nephrologist is the paramount in planning of uh, AV of fistula uh, of a dialysis access. Uh, uh, especially in resource limited settings like uh, uh, public health uh, centers, where you have a lot of uh, waiting uh, time for either procedure, either uh, the intervention uh, nephrology or uh, from uh, uh, fistula for the creation of AV fistula. Uh, we need interim accesses. So a femoral access is a, a beautiful way to bridge the gap between uh, uh, getting a more permanent uh, form of a, a tunnel uh, catheter or of uh, AV fistula. And uh, regarding your uh, points where uh, we, uh, uh, we negotiate more narrowed or previously utilized veins, uh, uh, Dr. Smriti, would you uh, like to tell us whether you use any uh, CT venographies or any uh, dye insertions during the procedure to ensure you know that uh, the veins are of adequate caliber before uh, trying to cannulate them, especially the veins which have uh, been utilized previously, uh, not the naive veins uh, where we expect the procedures to be uh, uh, less uh, complicated. Yes, absolutely. So uh, in patients who we are expecting there to be an issue because of uh, obvious previous history of multiple ca catheterizations, we sometimes, if we are getting a smaller vein or we are doubtful about a deeper uh, stenosis, we take we take a dye and we put it through the puncture site first. Like we take the punch we puncture the vein and then we put the dye and then we see the flow of it inside uh, in a fluoroscope. And if we are seeing an adequate flow, like, I mean, I don't think there's a fixed diameter that we exclude. If we see that the flow is going through and through to the heart or at least the SVC, uh, then we and try and negotiate a guide wire. If we can put in a guide wire, then generally we uh, try and put the catheter over it. 
Thank you, Dr. Thank Smith. You we'll go over to the next session. Thank you. I invite uh, chairpersons, Dr. Sumanlata, Director of Nephrology and Renal Transplant, Fortis Vasant Kunj, Dr. Anuja Purwal, Additional Director of Nephrology at Fortis Noida, and Dr. Mayur Trivedi, Consultant Nephrologist, PD Hinduja Hospital, Mumbai. And I request Dr. Vinit Behra to join us again as chairperson. Over to chairpersons. Meanwhile, yeah. Smriti, you have a lot of questions in the QA box. Can you take them live, Smriti? Yes, Smriti, absolutely. Them live. Yeah, you can answer them live in the QA box. Sure. Chairpersons, please. Yes, chairpersons. Yeah. Please. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, Dr. Suman, please go ahead. Yeah, so we have very interesting session. And first session is by Dr. Pallavi. She is assistant professor at Southern Hospital. She'll be covering the, what are the complications during permacath insertion, how we should manage that. And after that, we have two very young speaker, uh, Dr. Neha, she's nephrology follow. She'll be discussing about the long-term complication <laughs> along with Dr. Ashwini. She's consultant nephrology at fMRI hospital. I think straight away, without wasting time, we can proceed further. Over to Dr. Pallavi. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sumanata. I'll start by sharing my screen. Are my slides visible? Uh, are my slides visible? Can you can you hear me? Yes, yeah, they're visible, visible Pali. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I'll be talking about periprocedure complications of thyroid uh, hemodialysis catheter insertion. Uh, so certain periprocedure complications are common with all central venous catheters like arterial puncture, hemothorax, hemothorax, and I won't be covering these in detail because we have studied this extensively in medicine and surgery and in MBBS times. Uh, what I'll concentrate on is uh, complications of special concern in uh, tunnel catheters, which consists of uh, complications causing slow flow and no flow, like kinks, incorrect catheter tip position, and mediastinal placement, and some rarer syndromes like a, acute SVC syndrome dealing with unique anatomies and post-procedure bleeding. Uh, so one of the most common causes of uh, a poor flow in a catheter is a misplaced tip, and uh, we have to ensure that we know the correct positioning of the TCC tip. Already Dr. Smithy has mentioned that at the time of placement, as per Kidoki, the tip or tip, so if there are two, it's a split tip catheter, it should be in the mid atrium with the arterial lumen, that is this lumen should be facing towards the mediastinum. So in this case, we should ensure that when we are putting in the catheter, the venous port should be lateral so that the venous goes towards uh, the midline, whereas uh, the arterial lumen remains towards the Ma'am, uh, this is disturbance from Dr. Pallavi. Ma'am, this wise yeah. disturbance is coming from Dr. Pallavi's side, ma'am. Okay. Dr. Pallavi? Dr. Pallavi, can you hear us? Pallavi, ma'am, you have to re-log in, ma'am. Pallavi, please stop your audio and start again. Pallavi, please stop your audio and start again. There is some disturbance from your side. Just audio. No, it's still there. Uh, your Pallavi, voice Pallavi, is you clear. have to log in again. You leave the meeting and log in again. Pallavi, your voice is not clear.
Pallavi, try speaking. Let's see. Can you hear us, Pallavi? Please try speaking. No, you aren't audible. You aren't audible, Pallavi. Just leave the meeting and rejoin, please. Pallavi, please leave the meeting and join again. Yeah, I'll just take this time to confirm, to speak about a few important messages. Firstly, about the tip being in uh, in the right atrium. You know, the whole idea is that with various positional movement, and standing, supine, so the whole tip should be within the atrium. So the previous concept was to leave the tip at the junction of right atrium and the SVC. So in that, what happens when the patient is moving or sometimes in a different position, so there is a chance that the tip might come out of RA and enter the RA. So that becomes more thrombogenic. So now the universal thing is that the tip should be within the uh, the atrium. In fact, the mid of the right atrium. Yeah, I think we have Pallavi again. Pallavi, can you please yeah. start? Pallavi, please start sharing. Smriti, can you find out if Pallavi has an issue or we go ahead with Neha and uh, Dr. Ashwini and then Pallavi can join us a little later. Yes, yeah. ma'am, I think we should do that till then. I'll just... No, no, uh -huh. she's here, she's here. She's here. Let's continue. Okay. Lavi, can you just speak? Pallavi? Am I audible now? Yes, yes. yes. this is much better. Yeah. Thank you. So Bye. I'm not sure <laughs> where I was audible. No, but, you can uh, start from this. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so um, uh, just like Dr. Kunal had been pointing out earlier, a medial uh, tunnel can also be made and this has to be decided on a case-to-case -case basis in females who want to avoid breast area scars or we want to avoid uh, movement of the tunnel. Uh, in these cases, medial tunnel can be made, but in, in all cases, it should be ensured that it is in the right atrium. Uh, here are just two x-rays showcasing what can be wrong with the tip here is a tip which is too high. You can see it is at the uh, at the carina, which means it, it is at the SVC RA junction and it will cause uh, flow problems later on definitely. Here is another catheter which goes too deep into the RA. It can abut the wall of the RA. This can cause more chances of arrhythmias, more chances of cardiac perforations and it can also cause poor flows. Uh, with split tip catheters, now here we see in this x-ray, uh, with split tip catheters, there can be a problem that the entire functional length might not be in the RA. This x-ray is actually showing both the tips are outside uh, the RA, but especially when we are putting left-sided catheters, we should avoid split tip catheters because what happens is the venous tip, which is much longer, might come into the RA but the arterial port still remains somewhere in the innominate and we get poor flows because of that. Also important is to choose the right length of the catheter. So uh, always for left side, use 24 centimeter step uh, um, catheters or uh, parallel catheters, but not split tip catheters. For tall patients, more than five, uh, five and a half feet um, of uh, height, it is better to use 24 centimeter catheter even for the right side. In femoral catheters, the length varies as per the patient height. As Dr. Smithy has pointed out, sometimes for shorter patients, a 55 centimeter catheter might be too long, but preferably uh, right-sided uh, femoral catheters at least 35, 40 centimeters should be used. And in left-sided catheters, a 55 centimeter catheter should be used. Now, the uh, Kidigo says that Tunneled cuffed catheters should be done under fluoroscopy guidance, but we know that practically it is not available everywhere. And uh, so skin surface markings often have to be used to determine the perfect site for the tip. This was a study which said that the lower margin of the third and the first space correlates best with the SVC RA junction. Now we want to go within the RA, not at the SVC RA junction. So what I often do is uh, I take a midpoint of the space between the lower border of the third intercostal space and the Z-point process and consider that as the midpoint of the RA. In patients with pendulous press or who are very obese, I take it once a little lower because once they sit up, there is uh, a tendency of the migration of the catheter uh, upwards. Another 
thing which can be done to place uh, the tip correctly and especially in low resource settings if where fluoroscopy is not available and if an eco probe is available we can use it to uh, determine the site of the ra and then move laterally towards the right side mark it on the skin with uh, some kind of surface landmark and use this to calculate the length and to calculate the site where you want to keep the tip of the catheter and importantly on a post procedure x ray for a tunnel catheter it should be at least two vertebral levels below the carina and not at the level of the carina this is acceptable for a non tunnel catheter but for a tunnel catheter we need it much lower than the level of the carina uh we have talked about positional migration of the tip this is possible more common in obese and in women and um, the more lat a more lateral and a shorter tunnel helps to prevent the upward migration so coming to kinks uh kinks how uh, can often be seen tunnel catheter insertion now here again we have a catheter which seems to have a kink somewhere but it's very difficult to make out on one view so what i really wanted to point out is that if you think that the flow is not good a lateral view x ray is uh, is necessary covering the neck and the chest area both but actually this catheter had a great flow this was again a midline catheter which uh, we had uh, made a midline tunnel like uh, dr kunal has already uh, we have worked together and we've done a lot of midline tunnels uh, so there is no there was no kink in this catheter and it was a great flow but whether there is a kink or not you'll be able to delineate only with a lateral view now how to avoid kinks the most important part is not to rush when the catheter is being inserted in the peel away sheet uh, you have to ensure it is not twisted it is not kinked second thing dr smriti said she dissects a little bit at the venotomy site in my experience i have uh, had some problems if the dissection has not been well at the venotomy site so i prefer to dissect well uh, with a blunt dissection at the venotomy site which prevents kinking from any tissue bands and it prevents any acute angulation and more importantly we should take a smooth curve and a wider angle for the tunnel so here we have two x rays uh, if you take it more laterally if the tunnel is more lateral the angle will be more smooth here also uh, there was no kink but there are more chances of a kink if the tunnel is more uh, uh, acute angled so if there is any doubt it is better to take a more lateral um, uh, angle for the tunnel however in this x ray it's too lateral in what happens in these cases is the tunnel exit site is in the axilla it's very difficult for the patient to move somewhere closer uh, to the lateral chest wall somewhere here will be better when there is a kink blunt dissection at the venotomy site helps to open most of the kinks in some cases you need to reopen the site and slightly withdraw the catheter uh, ensure that it's untwisted and then reinsert but at all times uh, you should be very sure that you haven't pulled the entire catheter out be very careful while uh, withdrawing the catheter also it's important to avoid high punctures what happens is if we take a very high igv puncture apart from poor cosmesis there is more chance of an acute angulation and the turbulent blood flow may uh, causes increased thrombosis later on also uh, this x ray shows that a pacemaker is also in situ and the catheter is being placed on the same side generally it is better to avoid uh, catheters on the same side as the pacemaker because it might cause some uh, movement of the leads and uh, it's eventually it all has to go into the ra but uh, the the lesser time it the lesser uh, um, distance it traverses along with the uh, pacemaker lead the better another complication is mediastinal placement so if your catheter is mediastinally placed you will not get any uh, flow at all and it may occur in patients with central venous stenosis where sometimes your guide wire will just go through and through the vein but it can also sometimes occur otherwise to avoid this uh, what is an important caveat is ideally whenever we are putting a tunnel catheter the guide wire should go through the svc into the ra and then into the ivc it should cross the diaphragm if it is crossing the diaphragm you're sure it has gone into the ra and from there into the ivc and it could never be mediastinal so what often happens is we take the guide wire goes here and it kind of curls into the ra and we think it's probably most likely in the ra but even a mediastinal uh, guide wire will curve over here and you will not know that it is mediastinal 
here is a case actually uh, it is a case which dr varun had shared with us uh, we can see the uh, tunneled catheter it is outside uh, the vein this is uh, the svc and uh, we can see some mediastinal emphysema here what is interesting is uh, how to deal with it so removal of the uh, of a mediastinal placed catheter should be done in controlled settings hemodynamic mo monitoring is mandatory arrange for blood and it is better to have cardiology ct vas or vascular surgery uh, as a backup if uh, i have never personally ever seen a misplaced uh, tunnel catheter in an artery but i have seen uh, uncuffed catheters uh, uh, you know placed in the artery by mistake and the uh, most important lesson is never remove it on your own it is best done in ot by a vascular surgeon so regarding this mediastinal catheter i'll just uh, play this video of how uh, it was managed by dr varun so it uh, a puncture was taken or a fresh puncture was taken at the igv site and uh, a guide wire was inserted uh, eventually this uh, catheter was uh, removed the here you can see his, the the tunnel catheter was uh, removed after the guide wire was placed and we'll just go to the next slide okay uh so a balloon venoplasty was done here you can see the balloon was dilated and there is some wasting of the balloon at the site which was probably the venopuncture site after a few minutes of balloon dilatation uh, the uh, the balloon was uh, removed another fresh get guide wire was inserted a sheath was inserted and eventually the same catheter which was mediastinal was placed inside uh, the svc here we can see the final position and what i consider remarkable was how he managed to salvage the same catheter rather than remove it because i have personally had a similar experience but i just removed the cat uh, catheter and a fresh subclavian catheter was placed uh now uh, another interesting x ray so here we see a left sided uh, catheter has been placed uh now what do you think what are the possibilities where this catheter could be is this in the mediastinum is it in the accessory hemiazygous is it in the left intercostal vein or is it in the is it in a left sided svc so for this we need to uh, very thoroughly know the anatomy if we are placing tccs we need to thoroughly know the venous anatomy of the thorax uh if we see the left side uh, which was significant in this patient the left ij and ej uh, are meeting uh, meeting here and then the subclavian meets in, and drains into the left innominate but also importantly the left intercostal vein drains into the innominate and sometimes it can there can be rudimentary connections between this intercostal vein and the accessory hemiazygous vein or the coronary sinus which drains directly into the right atrium so if it this communication is open you might place a catheter into this communication and still have a great flow whereas if it is an is a is an accessory hemiazygous you will not get a, a good flow however this was a case of unique anatomy it was a not a misplaced catheter this catheter uh, dr kunal was also in this case and this catheter was actually a, uh, attempted firstly on the right side and the guide wire was always going on the left hemiphorax uh, despite multiple attempts and eventually when uh, a dsa was done it was seen that a, the patient had an isolated left svc so here we can see the isolated left svc which was draining into the ra and eventually that is why a left sided catheter was placed directly into the left svc so the answer here was d it was uh, an isolated left svc in which this catheter was there it is important to know about left svc because it is the most common venous anomaly uh, presenting in around 0.3 to 0.5% of population however complications can occur in catheters in uh, s uh, in the left sided svc because it's more commonly associated with uh, other cardiac anomalies there can be poor blood flow thrombosis uh, sometimes also um, the left sided svc can directly communicate with la instead of the ra and if there is a thromboembolism uh, it can go into the systemic circulation so uh, sometimes they can be right and left svcs together i won't go into details but it's important to know that uh, uh, 
the left SVC is also uh, a common venous anomaly. So since uh, we have already discussed this, uh, I'll, I'll just do this last case presentation of an acute SVC syndrome. Uh, Dr. Sayali and Dr. Smriti have discussed how uh, it's difficult to approach uh, stenosed veins. And um, this was a 50-year-old female who had come to us uh, for a tunnel cuffed catheter insertion. She had a history of right uncuffed catheter for six months and then a left uncuffed IGV catheter for two months. Uh, initially, we tried a right IGV uh, tunneled catheter, but the right by could not be negotiated beyond a few centimeters. And then eventually a left IGV tunnel catheter was inserted under ultrasound guidance. Now, what happened is within 10 minutes of the procedure completion, the patient became breathless and although and had difficulty in talking and slurring of speech, uh, saturations were normal, but she developed strider and swelling of face and neck. Within minutes, she went into respiratory arrest. And during intubation, it was noted that she had laryngeal edema. She was intubated, put on mechanical ventilation and shifted to the ICU. So I'll just play the CT video. It's actually a very fast video, but then I'll show you the screenshot of what is significant. So uh, here, if, we, if you can, I'll just pause it here. Uh, here is the right carotid, the right IJV is, is very attenuated here. This is the left carotid. I'll just play it again and then I'll show you some screenshots. Um, so here is the tunneled cuffed catheter on the left side, but the right IJV was almost completely obliterated in the lower end, which is why the left catheter could not be placed. And here is the SVC, which is uh, kind of narrow. Right. So uh, if you see, this was the left-sided tunnel catheter which was inserted. The right IGV was attenuated in the lower half and uh, the SVC was also quite narrow, which is what uh, probably it was the left IGV which was draining all of the laryngeal and pharyngeal muscles, which is why she developed uh, immediate laryngeal edema within 10 minutes of um, the catheter insertion and had to be intubated. Eventually, we had to remove the left catheter on the same day as it was inserted. Uh, facial and neck swelling gradually improved over five days and she could be extubated after 48 hours. And a left femoral uncuffed uh, HD catheter was placed. She was counseled for a PD and a femoral TCC but was not willing for the same and was lost to follow up. So we have commonly come across uh, SVC syndrome in chronic situations but it's important to know that it can present acutely as a medical emergency. And in patients with long-standing catheters, we should consider CT venography or peri-procedure venography like a dye insertion when we puncture the vein before attempting catheters. If there is any suspicion of venous stenosis, a venoplasty and stenting should be done simultaneously or before TCC insertion. However, as in the two cases which we have demonstrated, venoplasty is not a very, uh, it's a risky procedure. And many times there can be rupture of the veins. So I would say it is best uh, in people who are who are very experienced, maybe uh, Dr. Vineet might be able to tell me better, but uh, it's better to do it with the help of a vascular surgeon uh, rather than do it alone. At least I do not have personal experience of the same. So um, I, would, uh, I wouldn't attempt it without a vascular surgeon. Post-op bleeding, this is a minor complication as per a nephrologist, but I think... Um, Patients get really worried about this because uh, the entire uh, soakage, it leads them uh, to a lot of anxiety. So importantly, to avoid tunnel site oozing, you should take a, a small incision of the tunnel entry site. It should be just enough to fit the cuff. And this I have learned from Dr. Punal that um, make a small incision and use an RT faucet to kind of push the cuff inside rather than uh, make uh, your incision too large. If, however, the incision is a little large, you might take a purse string suture if the bleeding is persistent. In cases of severe uremia, the bleeding might persist for the first one or two dialysis and compression helps to improve it. And after one or two dialysis, once the uremia has settled, generally the bleeding will stop. I think that was the last um, simple complication to deal with. Uh, that's all from my side. I just wanted to say that we should keep 
going because that's how we'll grow despite all these complications. Uh, no ma the the more um, procedures we do, the more complications we'll face. But that's how we learn. It's just that we have to be aware about what complications there can be and if there is a complication, how to deal with it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pallavi, for the outstanding presentation. And you handle most of the complications quite well. So I would just take it forward and just pass on a message. I am very sure that many uh, students are also attending uh, this uh, this meeting. So the biggest message is that is to treat all these procedures with a with a lot of respect. And as you can see, all these procedures look very fancy, but uh, many of them can go wrong. And we all have seen deaths after a perm catch. And trust me, it's a very awful feeling to have that you take a patient for an elective procedure and you and you land up in uh, in actually losing the patient. So so as much as possible, I would strongly say wherever you can use a fluoroscopy. And especially if it is a left-sided thing or the patient has been pricked multiple times or it's a second or multiple catheter, you must insist for a fluoroscopy. And uh, and there are a, and it's it is not just about inserting the catheter, like the problem which uh, Dr. Smithy encountered that after passing the guide, it didn't go in. So the ideal thing would have been just to put a sheath, put some dye, and we, we actually immediately know that whether there is stenosis or there is a total occlusion or, or what is the problem. So, so we must, as much as possible, use a fluoroscopy and ultrasound guided puncture is a 100% mandatory thing. And uh, so as much as possible, I, I understand that in various settings, it may not be possible, but still, in the in the patients whom we anticipate some complications, especially uh, multiple perm cats, second use, third use, we must do it under fluoroscopy. Okay, I would just clarify a few points that uh, perm cats with a pacemaker, it has been done. It theoretically does sound that there may be displacement of leads, but uh, we should do it under ECG guidance and under fluoroscopy guidance. Generally, I have done one. People have done uh, quite often. It is well reported. It is safe. It can be done. So you may not skip that side. Second thing is uh, having a media channel entry. Trust me, if you have it, the safest option and the best option is to abandon the procedure, take the patient to OT, call your CTBS surgeon. Even if you are very confident, you have anyone with your site, never try and remove it. And uh, the best thing is to do a CT angiography, put a fluoroscopy dye, see the catheter and uh, and then only let them only remove it so uh, the, the what they do they generally put a covered stent and close the arterial uh, nick or or the vessel or if it is not being repaired by that they actually have to suture it up and uh, as you told correctly so these uh, uh, these central vein stenosis or the svc stenosis thrombus manipulating them so these procedures look very fancy but uh, you have to have a good uh, intervention and support. And uh, there is a strong learning curve. And the main problem of the learning curve is to handle the complications. Uh, during my initial days when I have tried, I have seen patients having pericardial effusion uh, in having SVC tear. So you should have a good interventional uh, support with you. And as you go ahead, you can fine tune further. So we would go ahead and uh, take the, uh, the, uh, the, the session further. We have two more speakers. Uh, please, uh, can uh, so can the other chairperson please introduce them? Yeah, so good evening, everyone. A very good presentation by Dr. Pallavi. So it was a very valid point which Dr. Vineet has still raised and discussed. So uh, for the beginners, it is very important to understand where to draw a line. We should not go very uh, aggressive in the angioplasty, post-angioplasty, post stenosis vessels, doing the procedures alone. And fluoroscopy in today's time is a must, especially in the left side of permanent cancer. So now for the next session, we have, just a second. For the next session, we have Dr. Neha Manhas. She's a nephrology resident at Medanta Hospital. And Dr. Ashwini Garde, she's consultant nephrologist at Fortis Hospital, Gurgaon. So over to you, Neha. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, as we all have uh, previously discussed that uh, a vascular excess is kind of a lifeline for a patient on, of chronic kidney disease on dialysis. Um, Neha, please share the slides. Yes. Sir.
Siddharth, can you help them? Siddharth, are you here? Siddharth. Yes, ma'am. Uh, help like, them. Uh, ma'am, slide share is on. Uh, now, ma'am, you have to just click on this share screen button, which is the green one in middle. Neha, look at the bottom of the screen. Ma'am, at the bottom of the screen in the center, there is a share screen button, ma'am. We are already doing that, but despite that, it seems to be not happening. Uh, ma'am, uh, just by clicking on share screen, the screen will appear in front of you, a small screen, which consists all the videos which has been opened, ma'am. All the all the windows which has been opened. So Please you have to just select the presentation out of that, ma'am. When you click on share screen, no, there will be a page that pops up. Click on PowerPoint presentation. Is your PowerPoint presentation open? Uh, yes. Uh, I am doing that, but somehow I don't know. It's not happening. Let me just. Uh, Ma'am, you do one thing. You click on share screen and just select the screen option there. So we will be able to view your entire uh, this desktop. There is no, no such option at screen. So you have to just, just uh, move your cursor. So you will be able to share, uh, share screen green button. Then on that is on. I have clicked that, and after that, there is desktop, whiteboard, iPhone, iPhone, Microsoft, Safari. These windows are open. Okay. So, Ashwini, why don't you share your presentation with one of us, and maybe we can share this? Uh, maybe that's the better idea. Yeah. Just put it on the WhatsApp group. We'll share it. Answer. <laughs> But even, ma'am, you can put in uh, the chat box also. So we will get quickly, ma'am. Mm -hmm. What's happening? Consistent. After after I nothing is working actually. After I done that, there is allow Zoom to share your screen, open system preference, security and privacy to grant access. Okay. I've done that, but that is also not. It's a problem matter than your uh, security uh, issue at your laptop, ma'am. You do one thing, ma'am. Uh, just in this chat box, be, besides smiley, there is one document option is there, ma'am. You click on that. Smriti, uh, is it possible for us to go ahead with the panel discussion, then come back to the talks? Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you uh, uh, invite the, Dana, can you invite the moderator for the panel group discussion so that we go ahead with the discussion? Meanwhile, Siddharth, help the girls out and the girls will uh, transfer the PowerPoint to Pallavi or Smriti. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Is it okay, Smriti? Yes, ma'am. We'll do that. Okay, right, right. Go ahead. Smriti. I invite Dr. Lowe. Love you love to unmute yourself. Yeah. So, uh, good evening, everyone. So, uh, this evening has been truly enriching in terms of knowledge and shared experiences about the vascular axis. And our speakers today have actually been very elaborate about their respective topics. So, that leaves very little room for doubts and uncertainty. But uh, I would still use this opportunity to learn more from our esteemed panelists. So, uh, first to uh, let's gauge the magnitude of the issue first. So, my first question would be to Dr. Vineet that uh, what percentage of your patient pool would actually depend on uh, perm cath as the vascular axis? Uh, yeah. So, so uh, my center is actually a PD first center and a fully wow. transplant center. So, so all my OPD patients generally who are following up on the on an OPD basis, they do have a fistula. By the time they reach CKD4, at the creatine of 3, 4, we start making a fistula. And when they approach dialysis, uh, if he has got a transplant prospect, then he goes for transplant. Or else, we first convince him for a peritoneal dialysis. And so around 60% go on a, on a PD for us. Those who are not going and have a, uh, and have a access fistula, so we make a fistula. So uh, perm cats are only those people who come to us or our center first time for a dialysis. In them also, um, uh, I would say that uh, as much as possible, if he's stable 
does not have pulmonary edema, any hyperkalemia or any complication, he goes straight away on a perm cath. We put an elective perm cath without uh, doing any double lumen catheter through the jugulus, and then we started dialysis. And so I would say that in the patients presenting first time, so they are only the uh, patients who go on a perm cath who, who uh, don't have any sign of complication. And I uh, and sometimes I would also share that uh, patients of acute kidney injury or RPRF who have come for the first time and we anticipate that uh, they may uh, require prolonged dialysis. Even those patients we have taken on a perm cath and uh, the, actually the infection rate is quite less and they, and they do quite well. Even if you land up removing the perm cath after about two, three weeks, it is still better than using a stiffer uh, temporary catheter, giving him infection and increasing the chances of venous thrombosis. So I would agree with this approach. Actually, uh, you work in a really, in an a ideal, ideal world scenario, actually, I should say. I mean, like, we work with more of a, the patients dependent on HD rather than PD. So yes, maybe the uh, pool of the patients would get classified into two categories in your case, and maybe they would fall in the one side of the uh, wall in our case, in most of the other areas in uh, India. But yes, I would say that uh, in most of the other centers, I would say a considerable number of patients would fall into that category. And uh, that's uh, that number should actually mirror most of the centers uh, who are uh, dealing with such patients on uh, Lami, chronic I would, and maintenance I, analysis. 100%, I would agree with you. Vineet seems to be working in paradise. I think <laughs> for the commoners like us, it's, it's not going to be that easy. Uh, I would say there would be also a difference in a public sector and a private sector because Definitely. getting like, the fistula done in a private sector would be much more easier because of the sheer numbers. And in the public sector, getting them. So I think, you know, even putting the perm cat first as the first access we wouldn't be too wrong in kind of because these patients are going to probably go out in on in in speaking in terms of a public uh, hospital they're going to go out and get dialyzed because you wouldn't be giving them maintenance dialysis they they may go to standalone centers they may go to charity centers where your level of uh, asepsis is going to be a little below average if i can say that so i don't think we would be too wrong in putting a perm cat as the first you know when they come that to is in fact that's in fact would be a very desirable approach and that would in fact increase the numbers and that 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 brings us to uh, actually as, uh, assess the magnitude of this issue that once and we start uh, changing our practice to include more patients uh, with acute dialysis so on least, perm cath, so that's a huge number of patients who are actually on perm cath. At least in public hospitals, so I am from Bombay and in Maharashtra, we have the health scheme which covers perm cath as a, so they get, the patient gets 40,000 rupees for a vascular access placement. So we are able to give perm cats for free so again, we do what we need does. We put a perm cath instead of, you know, trying and putting a joke at first. Right. right. Uh, at our center, uh, I will agree with uh, Dr. Lavi that majority <laughs> of our patients, apart from those patients who have been a regular OPD followers where we have opportunity to create a fistulas, rest of the patient, I would consider 60 to 70% of the patients who, who present to us with, uh, with uremic state there, we have to use either a temporary catheter, later on convert to permanent catheter, or if they are stable enough where we can place a permanent catheter directly, then we do it. However, at our center, we practice it that before discharging the patient, we make it sure that we place it on a permanent catheter because then it becomes difficult. They 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 present again after three to four weeks if you are not able to follow up. Yeah, if you are not able to follow up in a dialysis center, they sometimes miss it. So I agree with Dr. Vineet in that, that, okay, permanent catheter, yes, we do also practice. But our 70% of the patient, we have to place start dialysis either through a temporary catheter or tunnel catheter. Dr. Anuja, as I said, Dr. Vineet seems to be working in paradise for commoners <laughs> like us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think I agree with you before center. discharging the patient. Clean uh, of government yeah, centers, sir. Yeah, not yeah. even just yeah. government centers. And here, <laughs> the patient has to pay for AV fistula also and permanent catheter also. And if you are giving a temporary catheter, then that also. So uh, it becomes you know, a challenge. Yeah. Yes, agree. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. so where it is possible, I place permanent office, catheters. Yes. Yeah. So I would yeah. just pose one question to all the panelists that whenever you are selecting a first time a catheter insertion, temporary versus permanent, so, which are the conditions where you would upfront go for a perm cat? Or what all cases uh, you would not do a perm cat and do a temporary catheter? 
So See, can you just try I to... will personally, if the patient has severe metabolic acidosis, of course, with hyperkalemia, none of us will go and put it, put the straight away permanent catheter. If the patient looks quite uremic, not like he is elderly, he's fragile, in such patients, I would like to stabilize such patients and then put a permanent catheter. But yes, if patient is young, well-preserved, he has come at a reasonably decent time for initiation of dialysis, in these patients, I prefer putting a permanent catheter. I think we, we need... What's your experience, Dr. Transplant. Mayuri? Yeah, for a preemptive transplant, you may get away with just, you know, not even putting a TCC. You just want to give a few sessions of dialysis before yeah. the transplant. Maybe you would just go for a temporary catheter. But otherwise, yeah. I, I think I agree with Dr. Anuja that it's clinical. Patient stable, you go with, you know, initiation. You go with a planned TCC and do the initiation. If the patients come in volume overload and, you know, he requires dialysis in the next half an hour, you just put up, you know, it's always the patient first. So, so yeah. I would say what we follow is that if we are needing to put a jugular, we straight away put a perm cap. So only emergency is a pulmonary edema or encephalopathy so, or hyperkalemia. Safe, safe. So we do a femoral. So because that saves one more uh, puncture yeah, into the yeah, jugular. Yeah. Jugular. Yeah. For the thrombosis. That I agree. That I agree. That's, that's must, exactly what we are And doing. that's what all the guidelines say that we should yeah. minimize the use of uh, stiffer catheters mm -hmm. and maximize the use of perm caps. So apart from the paradise that Dr. Vineeth is working in, I think we agree on most of the points regarding the placement of a perm cap. And there's another point I think everybody would agree with that the, uh, the most common problem that we face is that a poor functioning, malfunctioning catheter, which is mostly attributed to a thrombus. Now, so previously at our center, what we used to do is that we used to have a protocol using urokinase every 15 days to prevent these complications and to have a very good functioning catheter. But now that urokinase is not readily not available, available. So most of us have actually landed, us, landed in a soup. So my question to all of you would be like, how are you dealing with this problem? Do you Are you using any alternative agents or alternative strategies to counter this problem? Yeah, uh, there are other thrombolytics available. We have Altiplase, Retiplase, so they can be used. Uh, the are guidelines... you using in specific any of them? Yeah, we are using Altiplase. Okay. And, so are you uh, using and... it prophylactically? She's no, asking... no, 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 not prophylactically, therapeutically. For... I'm sorry, so therapeutically. So we for prophylaxis, right? Um, both, both actually. Like, uh, okay, that urokinase, I think, was a cheaper drug, so you could be used prophylactically, but the cost prohibits the use of Altiplase and other thrombolytic agents, I believe. So again, like the question would be like, okay, what alternatives are you using in which setting and maybe whatever dose you're using would be helpful to the audience? See, my center, we only use it therapeutically. But what you're saying is right. Even now, some centers do uh, <laughs> prophylactic monthly administration of a thrombolytic. But that is not recommended and we don't do it. So we... I think it's risky. I mean, our patients it's are risky. anyway very, uh, you know, uh, prone to bleeding. Yeah. Uh, so... We use that 20 milligram vial and it costs, uh, and uh, we use 2 milligram per patient. And though the guidelines say that we should use it one time, but uh, we use it 2 milligram and close it and keep it in the fridge and use for the next patient. Next patient so yeah. generally, nothing happens. And uh, many of us, uh, I mean, um, uh, many people are doing that. So that we do. So and, this you're talking of urokinase? No, uh, Altiplase. Actualize. How Actually, long, right. sir, have you kept it for maximum duration? They say one month, but within two weeks, generally, we finish off. Yeah. So, Actually, even it, regarding Altiplate events, I used it in a couple of my patients, if I might add here. So that uh, that 18 mg injection was actually was, uh, available for 17,000. So we used uh, 2 mg injection in each yeah. four, 2 mg dose for each Absolutely. patient and kept it for the interdialytic duration of 48 to 72 hours uh, based on the dialysis frequency. So yeah. the good part, part was that we could achieve that uh, uh, good catheter function in all the patients that we use the uh, drug in. And there was no untoward incidence of bleeding. And this was also therapeutic use rather than to prevent catheter yeah. thrombosis. Yeah, yeah at, my, at our center, I, we only use it for therapeutic purposes. We don't use it as a prophylaxis. But yes, once urokinase was available, it was readily used. Yeah. But later on, we have used yeah. in a couple of patients alti please. But uh, not not much, not much. I have had an experience of using Tenecteplase thanks to the government setting I'm working in. So it's 40,000 per injection, but that was the only available formality in the hospital. Uh, so the I read a study in which they're using like 2 milligram per uh, lumen for 120 minutes. 
and if it doesn't improve you you give 2 uh, mg again for another 120 minutes so we have personally used in two patients in one of the patients it improved immediately after like 120 minutes but in the second patient despite the second installation there was no improvement and then uh, we kept the 2 mg installed overnight after that but there were beautiful flows of more than 300 ml per minute in both the lumens uh, but like dr vineet said uh, we have kept this uh, tenectoplase uh, for use for the next patient because uh, we have used only 4 mg and it's a 40 mg vial i'm sure i don't know how, yeah, how long know. we yeah. can use it again so for how long did these flows last so, so the catheter was okay it, after that? So the catheter was working well. It's been one month post-procedure and uh, we haven't yet used the remaining for any other patient. Let's hope we get a patient quickly so that we can finish it off. I think trisodium citrate is quite uh, readily available and as a yeah. prophylactic, it can be used. I think it has some antibiotic activity as well so you, know, you can prevent infection in that setting as well so have you used that citrate solution i mean for uh, prophylactic things i mean yes, like yes we are we are using commonly so you know, it comes by the name of serosate laranon i think yeah, is the only thing it is producing so okay. you, know, you dilute it to up to 10 percent is it, it is i think around 41.7 percent so it has to be made around four percent so you dilute it and keep it uh, in the catheter as a lock. Plus, no, in in especially gentamicin and lock. Gentamicin not uh, give with the heparin, which is not recommended. So in that case, it is uh, better to use uh, tried sodium citrate. Okay, so uh, is it uh, to be used for all the after every session? Do you use it or you use it for like? Uh... I mean, like, is, is it, is a it, is, it is it is like it is a lock. It is a lock solution. So it's you use just it. Just use a simple lock every. solution. So okay. even even for temporary catheters, you know, we are using because a lot of time, you know, as doctor, you know, we were previously discussing, you know, most of our patient, you know, whether you start or what kind of access you are starting will depend on a lot on the financial status of the patient, whether insurance is there or cash patient. Do you want a pump cat then a fistula for any cash patient? So in that, you, know, you have to prolong the life of the catheter. So in, in even in temporary settings, we are using quite commonly trisodium citrate. Actually, so I think it comes in 4% also, sir. Like, in fact, the 47%, I think, has been discontinued now. That's no, what that the is available. 4% other... is not available. Okay, okay. That is the only vial, and it can be reused multiple times. So you, and it is cheap, you know, 120 rupees for one vial. And it mm -hmm. can be used multiple times because it has to be diluted. Okay. So, uh, trisodium citrate was also being used in, in a center where I was working in Chennai, in SRMC. And uh, in fact, uh, they saw uh, Dr. Jay Prakash had also published a, a quasi-experimental study on this in which the rates of infections were also lower, like Dr. Kunal has already pointed out, in patients on uh, a lock with trisodium citrate compared to a hip lock. So personally, I don't have much experience in its use, but I just wanted to point that. I think they marketed it as an anti-infective uh, uh, kind of an agent rather than the uh, anticoagulant. Uh, uh, if they, you know, the marketing was completely the same that it was an anti-infective thing. But it it works both. No, so for us, no, it it solves both the problems. Exactly. Yeah, I totally agree. I think this would be much preferable to all the costly alternatives that we have been, uh, I mean, like forced to use. So this was something which I've never used before, but this, uh, I mean, this is something which is very practically doable and uh, this can be I used on a long-term basis. So uh, now moving to a very Ooh, rapidly. Dr. I'm sorry, did I interrupt? <laughs> okay. Please, actually, now moving very rapidly to the next question, like uh, it is actually uh, to Dr. Anuja, like, how do you take care of a, a very precious perm cat which has got infected? This is also a very common scenario. Yeah, the patient who has got multiple axis failure. Sometimes we are only left with one functioning permanent catheter and when it gets infected. So ideal is that you start patient, uh, send blood cultures, start empirical antibiotics and then you take, uh, if it is very precious, if you have a temporary axis available, place a temporary catheter and start doing dialysis through that and give it an antibiotic lock. 
Else, if you have to use the same catheter, and if the immediate removal is not indicated, like patient is not hemodynamically unstable, patient is not uh, in shock, and you can afford to continue the dialysis, we have to use the same catheter, start empirical antibiotic, and start doing an antibiotic lock. That's what I do. And later on, if in like 48, 72 hours, and maybe three to four days, patient improves, then we can continue using it. The problem arises when the patient is not improving, then at that situation, I don't know, we have to take it out and then look at the other options available. Uh, that's actually a, a very practical point that you have highlighted uh, from the audience here. And it's not an, uh, but my question here would be like, how do you, how long do you continue these locks? Because uh, it's very, it's not very unusual to come across patients who have turned deaf because of routine use of gentamicin locks, which they've been using since forever. See, ideally, uh, for that, I mean, like, for the catheters where immediate removal is indicated and we are not able to do it and we are somehow managing with these catheters, these locks should be continued for indefinite time. We don't know what. However, we should avoid using gentamicin in that situation. But for other catheters where they are able to, their patient remains stable, there two to six weeks is the time depending on the organism which has come up in the blood culture. If it is like two weeks, two to three weeks is a good enough time, <coughs> usually, which I have seen. Yes, in case a precious catheter, staph, aureus and other things, however, for a staph, pseudomonas, we all know that we have to remove the catheter. There is no other way out. Else, we can use the antibiotic locks for two to six weeks for the situations where we cannot remove it. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for that. What's insight? your, Dr. Mayuri, Dr. Vineet? I mean, I just have got... one point to add here that uh, this is a trick that I learned from my infectious disease specialist. So they, that, that team used to tell us that try and give the antibiotics through the catheter in case you need to salvage the catheter. So when you are giving your systemic antibiotics, rather than putting a central line or an IV line, use the same catheter as a central venous axis and give the antibiotics through that. So that's one other doable thing that you can do, even if the patient is, uh, even if the patient is hemodynamically stable and you are giving it on an OPD basis, when he comes to dialysis, you know, you can give it post session, use the same. Yeah, after, after discharge, we can use it. But yeah. once the patient yeah. is admitted, I usually prefer using another axis, another central line or a peripheral no, this axis is for, for somebody, giving this. This is for somebody whom you Who's need coming, to salvage the line yeah. and you don't have any other axis. Yeah. On those, those patients, yeah, definitely. It's you, you, yeah. One, are you not risking, uh, no, uh, sorry, are you not risking you no know, giving more endotoxemia to those patients you know, while using the catheter? Using I the don't know. I have been doing this and I haven't worsened any patient, but I, I really don't know what the answer for this is. I'll uh, go back and I think the question here is like, if, if there's an alternative access available, that would, it, it's actually, it's what even I do that to avoid the catheter that is infected for the same, the reason that Dr. Kunal has highlighted, the risk of bacteremia and endotoxemia. But I think this question is more uh, directed to address the issue that uh, there are patients who have no, absolutely no lines available and they come at a situation when they have uh, infection in that one particular catheter that was, uh, I mean, so, the lifeline for a very long time. So, so this so, is something which is tricky in now. Uh, so what, what we do is that if it is a very precious catheter, only line available, no other line available. So you first try with antibiotics, maybe wait for two or three sessions. And in case not happening, suppose he has got a right IJV. So uh, take a fresh puncture through that same vessel, insert a temporary catheter, remove the perm catch, so generally, if the catheter is out, most of the seeding is gone and they improve. Give him a course of antibiotics. So after he's infection-free, exchange with a new catheter. So this I have tried in some patients, but again, so some of them don't actually uh, respond and uh, we have to uh, remove it. I think mm -hmm. you I a totally valid point. And now I would, uh, and actually all the points were so practically important. Now I would quickly move to the last question of the session since the time is winding up. Now we, can I just question? interrupt you? Okay. Uh, Lavi, I'm sorry. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Ashwini's presentation uh, is loading. So can okay. we just try and take uh, that first? Sure, sure, we may. Sure. We'll just uh, add a try if, she, uh, if she's able. Because of the multiple videos and it's not uploading 
completely okay, you I can will start to without any videos and if just in case if my luck if something is happening then we will proceed with videos otherwise we'll just leave it is that okay yeah yeah, yeah. let's just okay. give it a try once okay. Dr. Ashwini, sometimes if it's a problem with the bandwidth, you can stop your own uh, video as in camera and it kind of helps sometimes. So that's why uh, I kind of stopped mine when I was sharing my screen. We can see your screen. You can just put it on a uh, slideshow. Can you unmute yourself? I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. You switch it off. Oh, just a second. Okay. So um, I'm so sorry because many much of the delay happened and despite that I'm unable to upload my videos also. So uh, however, we try to reduce the use of permacath in our situation around 30 to 40% of our patients end up getting the permacath as their access. Now it can be inertia from the patient side, it can be their only inevitable access possible, or it could be because of uh, really as in unfortunately could be a doctor's inertia also. Uh, now I will discuss the long-term complications associated with permacap, only non-infectious one, which predominantly includes fibrin sheath, thrombus, and stenosis. Okay. So um, if you do the venography of all the patients with permacap, majority will have some amount of uh, fibrin sheets, some amount of uh, thrombosis, but these will be asymptomatic ones. Now, the thing which are important, the patients which are important and will bother you is patients with catheter dysfunction, obviously, who have low blood flow, who are less, uh, who are unable to give sufficient URR, we are unable, there is no backflow in the catheter. And if there is obvious symptoms in terms of swelling of the limbs or the face, now, whenever we uh, come across these kinds of patients, what is our first response in the dialysis unit is the forceful saline flush, which is generally done with 10 cc syringe. Now, I have seen people using 2 cc syringe also sometimes. Now, that's dangerous because the force generated can actually rupture the catheter also. So, 10 cc syringe should suffice. And if that uh, uh, doesn't work, now that we were discussing already intraluminal thrombolysis, urokinase versus uh, TPA, obviously uh, there are multiple studies done. TPA has been found to be superior to it. 2 mg per ml or 1 mg per ml, both should be equal in most of the studies. Dokedoki recommends 2 mg per ml. Urokinase, the studies have done from 10,000 uh, units per ml to 25,000. My personal experience goes to 25,000 and which com comparatively works well. Now, there are two methods, either a dwell method where we can just put the uh, thrombolytic agent inside and leave it for 30 minutes and recheck. Or otherwise, there is another protocol, push protocol, where after every 10 minutes, you give a 0.3 cc of saline inside so as to push the thrombolytic agents inside the suspected uh, thrombosis and fasten the process. Now, it won't work in all the settings. And why I'm saying so is because there are two kinds of thrombosis. One is intrinsic thrombosis, which can happen inside the catheter or around the catheters. Now, these are only 5 to 25% of the uh, thrombosis. And in those cases only, it is expected that in, uh, this intraluminal thrombosis will work. Now, majority of extrinsic thrombosis, which are attached to the vessel wall or which are inside the right atrium, it is unlikely to respond. And also, even if you get the response, this is generally short-lived. Now, it's important to understand uh, that the uh, whenever you put the catheter because of the mechanical trauma, because of the inflammation generated and the stasis, the fibrin sheet will start to uh, form within 24 hours. But with time, it will get more organized and a more cellular component will also appear in it. 
with uh, fibrous tissue and even muscular tissue also. So in that case, uh, whenever you put a thrombolytic agent, it will take care of only the thrombotic component of the fibrin sheath and might give you some result for temporary duration. But the cellular component will not be handled. And so that is why it, may, it, be, it is possible that you may not achieve any patency. And even if you achieve, there is high recurrence rate. So whenever such situations happen, especially if even after putting, putting the uh, intraluminal thrombolysis, even after achieving the patency, if the failure rate is within less than two weeks, it's better to go ahead with venography than because you are dealing with something more complicated. Now, the, you can do venography either by pull, pull back venography via the catheter itself or um, uh, other sites like the uh, fistula site, the cephalic vein, the IJV vein, even the femoral vein, though not very preferred, or CT venography also, but you can't do intervention at the same time. And the three possible mechanisms you can found that because your intraluminal thrombolysis does not work, not work. It is either a fibrin sheet, it is either a central venous or neural thrombosis, which can be very chronic, causing the stenosis also, and the catheter-related atrial thrombosis. Now, fibrin sheet is almost universally present, and if it is present and that is causing the catheter dysfunction, you have two options. One is to strip it off with the help of snare. But it is very infrequently att attempted because it is very costly and the success rates are very poor. It will, uh, so be best idea would be to change the catheter over the guide wire and add, at the same time do the balloon plasty of the fibrin sheath. That's more cost effective. Now, if there is central venous or mural thrombosis in the vessel wall, now ideally this is as per the uh, deep pain thrombosis guidelines by ACCP, but uh, ideally all the catheters should come out. And because they are attached to the venous wall or the um, atrial wall, the, it, the, the, they are at low risk of embolization. So you can remove the catheter safely and keep the, your patient on anticoagulation for at least three months. Now, having said that, if your patient has very poor expectancy, if patient has any, uh, it, he's bedridden or he or she is having terminal malignancies, Rather than doing all this, it is possible that you just uh, put the patient on anticoagulation. And if your catheter is dysfunctional at the same time, you can just advance the catheter inside the RMO further to negotiate that thrombosis. And, and this is just a getaway for some time. Now, the third possible things which you can come across is catheter-related atrial thrombosis. Now, then, uh, when the study was done with the 2D echo in all the dialysis patients with the catheter, around 18% had that. But very occasionally, we found this to be symptomatic. Symptoms could be in the form of pulmonary embolism, right heart failure, even cardiogenic shock, and most commonly, infections. Now, the thing is, though these are uh, rare side effects, these are very life-threatening. So, all the CRAT needs management. It's better to do transesophageal study if patient is allowing because uh, then you, you will have more better picture. And what we need to look at the catheter-related thrombosis is what is the size of the thrombosis, whether it is too large that it is not allowing the blood to come into the RA at all, or whether it is attached to the wall of the atrium, adhered to the atrium, or whether it is hanging down from the catheter tip. Because in that case, the chances of embolization with whether the, at the same time there is endocarditis or catheter-related infection, and whether patient has patent foramen UV. So if your catheter is very, uh, if your uh, crat is very small, less than two centimeter maybe, irrespective of whether it is neural or uh, catheter tip hanging down, thrombosis, you can remove it and uh, uh, further treatment may not be needed. But if it is more than that, if it is too large of, and with associated other indications for surgery, like a very large idea, uh, 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 it is taken at six centimeter as large, but it depends upon the patient situation also. If there is patent foramen oval and if there is sepsis, it's better to go for a surgical uh, method. Obviously, a CKD patient is a not very easy patient to send to such a big surgeries. So, in between, there are other choices which can we, we can try, but uh, they have tried very um, infrequently in the catheter-related arterial thrombosis, especially in the dialysis patients. 
This is predominantly tried in the pulmonary embolism setting with a very good efficacy and safety because the dose of thrombolytic agent, the catheter directed thrombolysis, you can try, but and the dose of uh, thrombolytic agent uh, which is required for it is pretty low. Around there are a couple of uh, case series where the mean dose was only around thirty six to forty. Uh, milligram as opposed to a systemic thrombolysis where you would need 100 to 200 milligrams of uh, articles. So uh, the catheter directed thrombolysis is one option which we can try where uh, articles at 2 mg per ml will flow through the catheter and you repeat the echo around uh, 8 to 12 hourly to check whether there is any reduction in the catheter size. Now, if uh, there are other options like section thrombectomy also, uh, this is a very not tried method and this is completely theoretical to me, so I won't uh, go into the details of it. If despite intervention, uh, there is residual thrombus and if the, your patient, as I said, can, cannot undergo these complicated procedures, uh, then we are left with no other choice but to keep the patient on systemic anticoagulations. And, uh, and and one report, there is almost 50% of resolution even with systemic anticoagulation. It's just that um, at the same time, the catheter, or you should, at the, uh, some point of time, you should take the removal uh, decision of catheter removal also. So if the uh, thrombus is attached to the atrial wall, you can uh, do this uh, catheter directed thrombolysis uh, or may not do that if the patient doesn't allow, but remove the catheter safely because chances of embolization are less. As opposed to if it is dangling, hanging down the catheter tip, it's better to uh, wait till all the thrombus is resolved and then only remove the catheter, keep the catheter in C2. Now, central venous stenosis uh, is another complicated thing which we come across uh, and there are multiple risk factors like number and duration of previous catheter placements, the location of the uh, previous catheter placements, subclavian being the highest, the caliber of uh, your catheters, even pacemaker wires, defibrillators and pick lines, they causes central venous stenosis quite often. So that, that is also important cause of uh, central venous stenosis. And catheter tip position is important as we had discussed. If it is just in the SVC and the junction of RA, then there are high chances that it will have some stenosis. So prefer to put your uh, tip inside the RA. Obviously, thrombosis and infection will worsen the scenario. Now, if your patient with a central venous stenosis is asymptomatic with no dysfunction in the fistula or catheter, there are no recirculation, the dialysis is adequate, then it is possible that your patient may not need any treatment because over the period of time, the collaterals have developed and they're taking care of the uh, uh, stenosis by their own. And uh, see, central veins are very, um, I would say, difficult to undergo plasty. They are very elastic and the results of plasty are also not very good. The recurrence rate is very high. So don't we may not touch these kinds of uh, uh, stenosis and just leave it. But if your patients are having symptoms, if there are catheter dysfunctions, then balloon angioplasty is uh, needed. Uh, in that case, uh, only plasty at first go. But if on table, if, if your vascular surgeon or interventional radiologist feels that the elastic recoil is significant, then he might consider stenting the uh, lesion. Otherwise, if the stenosis is occurring within three months of your plasty, then better to put a stent also. If uh, at the first time, whenever you have encountered the stenosis, if there is a large thrombus also, obviously or your patient need first anticoagulation, dissolve the thrombus, and then only you can uh, do the plasty. So um, now there are a uh, few patients uh, where uh, there is a permacath, we are planning to have a fistula also, and there is stenosis. So it, uh, whenever there is a thrombus or stenosis, remove the permacath and at the same time make the AV fistula. So by making the AV fistula and AV graft in the periphery, you are keeping that system uh, of central veins at high flow. So uh, with anticoagulation, the, uh, the, the thrombosis will not uh, worsen henceforth with anticoagulation and also the high flow system, there will not be any stasis. So chances of thrombosis will also reduce. 
meanwhile put the femoral permacath uh, that would be better and once uh, your fistula or av graft is matured enough to use then you can do the repeat plasty of the lesion whatever venous hypertension you have come across it will wean off over the period of time so to save the central veins at the same time doing the fistula uh, or uh, wow. uh, any high high flow system is better to save those central veins in terms if you are using uh, if your patient has good life expectancy so obviously the prevention is better than cure so avoid catheter placement especially on the same side as fistula right is always right so put the catheters predominantly on the right if it is needed avoid subclavian catheters avoid pick lines in your dialysis or non dialysis patients a meticulous placement as we have discussed uh, previously also uh, uh, about the placement details a meticulous placement is uh, necessary so that you uh, will cause minimum injury to the vessel wall you should not use iv drugs or contrast imaging uh, con contrast medias via the catheters evaluation of hypercoagulable state if it is if a history of repeated uh, thrombosis is there wow. uh, catheter lock solution i am sure you already have discussed but uh, still i would uh, heparin and citrate are the one which have been uh, recommended by kedoki predominantly as the uh, to maintain the patency and also with some antimicrobial properties uh, recently uh, to the san protocol which Can is you can Whatever, you just read up the talk? Uh, Dr. Yeah, Neha? You're using either heparin or citrate twice a week, but once a week, give a thrombolytic agent that will have. Dr. Neha, Neha, can you please speed up your talk? As, as we are overshooting the time, Dr. Neha, Neha can you please speed up your talk? Ashwini, ma'am, can you just. Uh, yes, yes, uh, yes. Thank you. Oh, and I will see if I can share the. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Neha, for your presentation. I request Dr. Smith and her to give her closing comments. Hello. 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 Your closing comments, please. Hello. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Ashwini, ma'am. Hello. Hi. Uh, so I would like to, we've already overshot the time by almost one hour, but I hope this was a talk which was useful for everyone. And I'm thankful to the, uh, to Win India, Dr. Manjusha and Dr. Arbula for giving us this opportunity to be able to present uh, interventional nephrology talks to everyone. And I'm thankful to all the attendees who have stayed with us for uh, almost two and a half hours now. Uh, I think uh, I can say this on behalf of all my colleagues that uh, we have been very honored to be given this platform. And we would love to uh, take this forward and maybe be part of WIN again in some other form again. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you all the thank all speakers and the chairpersons and audience. Thank you all and good night. Thank you all and good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Siddharth. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Smriti, especially. Thank you so much, Rana, too. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity.